if human rights did not occasionally discomfort governments, yeah. what on earth would be the point of having it in the first place? Thank you. The next item of business is a stage three proceedings on the Court Reform Scotland Bill. In dealing with the amendments, members should have the bill is amended at stage two, that is SP Bill 46A, the Marshall List, that is SP Bill 46AML, the groupings, that is SP Bill 46AG. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the afternoon. The period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds. Thereafter, I will allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible after I call that group. Members should now refer to the marshalled list of amendments. I call group one, minor technical and draft amendments. Amendment number 19 is in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with other amendments as shown on the groupings. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 19 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In the main, these 24 amendments are minor and technical in nature and, in general, will improve the clarity and consistency of the Bill's provisions. However, there are a couple of amendments that would benefit from some explanation. Amendment 31 removes Section 101.7b from the Bill, and I am satisfied that this provision is unnecessary. The inherent power of the Court to deal with vexatious proceedings was recognised by Lord Reid and Lord Advocate V. McNamara, where he observed that, and I quote, an action might be dismissed as incompetent if it was not brought for a legitimate purpose. I consider that this provision could have been read as a limitation of that power. Its removal clarifies that the power to dismiss vexatious proceedings is not just available to the court in proceedings brought by a litigant who has had a vexatious litigation order made against them. In addition, the bill expands the powers of the Court of Session to make rules under new sections 96.1 and 97.1, allowing the court to make provision both for and about the steps that the court may take where there has been an abuse of process, such as raising vexatious proceedings in any case. Amendment 37 amends Section 111 of the Bill. Section 111 of the Bill amends the Court of Session Act 1988, replacing the current Section 40. The effect of the replacement is to provide that permission will be required prior to an appeal being possible from the Court of Session to the Supreme Court. This amendment is consequential on that change, ensuring that appeals from decisions, whether final or interlocutory, in exchequer or tax cases, continue to be treated in the same way as appeals to the Supreme Court from final judgments on the merits. And I'd be happy to answer any questions which members may have, and I move Amendment 19. Lee Murray. Yes, uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I don't really have any questions on the amendment. The only question I have is why there are 24 drafting amendments being brought here at Stage 3, in, in addition to a number of other amendments, when it's the government itself which has drafted the bill. Why do we have all these errors having to be corrected at the final hurdle? Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to wind up? Well, I think it's a very complicated bill. Drafting is, by nature, a very complicated action, and I think we should welcome the diligence uh, that parliamentary draftsmen have shown. Thank you. Um, the question is that Amendment 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. We now move to Group 2, which is a number of summary sheriffs. I call Amendment number 60 in the name of Margaret Mitchell in a group of its own. Margaret Mitchell to speak to and move Amendment number 60. Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. In his written evidence, the Lord President emphasised the importance of the appointment of summary sheriffs when he stated that the absence of a third judicial tier has been a flaw in our court system for too many years. The introduction of summary sheriffs fills this void and is to be welcomed. He also confirmed during the Justice Committee oral evidence session of 29th April the vital part that these sheriffs would play in securing the success of the court reforms when he stated that the key to the whole thing is the appointment and effective deployment of summary sheriffs because that arrangement provides the opportunity to take out a huge caseload from the lower end of the Sheriff Court and to free up that court. The reforms, the reforms start at the bottom 
and work their way up. The key is to get the summary sheriff system working effectively. However, during the same oral evidence session on 29th of April this year, the Minister emphasised that it will take about 10 years to make the crossover and that summary sheriffs will be faced in when it's appropriate. There is there, this is therefore a probing amendment. It's not uh, an attempt to micromanage the Scottish Court Service. Um, its effect would be to ensure that an adequate number of summary sheriffs are appointed during the implementation phase of these reforms to safeguard the efficient delivery and administration of justice. Furthermore, it would assist members to hold the government to account on this particular reform as we conduct much needed post-legislative scrutiny. So I would be grateful if the Cabinet Secretary could provide further clarification and reassurance about the appointment of summary sheriffs. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm happy to try uh, and do that. Amendment 60 seeks to ensure that the First Minister must recommend a sufficient number of individuals to be appointed to the office of the Summary Sheriff in order to ensure the efficient administration of justice. Uh, I believe that this is an unnecessary amendment, although I accept the spirit in which Margaret Mitchell has moved it as a probing one. The Lord President of the Court of Session is under an obligation in terms of Section 2 of the Judiciary and Court Scotland Act 2008 to ensure the efficient disposal of business in Scotland's share of courts. And in terms of Section 1 of that Act, the First Minister is already under an obligation to have regard to the need for the judiciary, which includes the Lord President, to have the necessary support to carry out their functions. The appointment process for judges, which will also apply to the appointment of summary sheriffs, already involves a close working relationship between the Scottish Government the Judicial Appointments Board for Scotland, the Lord President and the Scottish Court Service. And this working relationship was established under the 2008 Act, passed unanimously by this Parliament. The substance of the Member's Amendment already forms part of the obligations incumbent upon the First Minister under the 2008 Act, and I would therefore urge the Member to withdraw her amendment in recognition that there already is sufficient information and indeed requirement there. Margaret Mitchell, to wind up and to press or withdraw? Yeah, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that explanation. I think it's, it's good that we have that on record and the point has been highlighted and awareness is um, drawn to it. And on that basis, I'm happy to withdraw, Presiding Officer. The Member seeks to withdraw uh, the amendment. Does any Member object to or so doing? No. In that case, uh, the amendment is... We now move to Group 3, which is Proceedings for Damages for Personal Injury. Uh, I will call Amendment No. 61 in the name of Elaine Murray. Group with Amendments No. 65, 7, 8 and 9. Elaine Murray to move Amendment 61 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I will start by moving Amendment 61 in case I forget at the end. Uh, this Parliament has always taken the issue of personal injury caused by exposure to asbestos very seriously. Many members have raised the issue in Parliament through various mechanisms, including members' debates. Uh, Des McNulty promoted a members' bill back in 20, 2006, and in 2009 we passed the Scottish Government's Damages Asbestos-Related Conditions Act. My colleague John Pentland brought these amendments to the Justice Committee at Stage 2, when the Cabinet Secretary assured us that the Government believed that all cases that merit counsel would continue to benefit from counsel. He also stated that amendments lodged later in Stage 2, considering easing the test uh, for the remit to, to this, from the Sheriff Court to the Court of Session, would allay concerns. Mr McCastle gave assurances to the committee that he would continue to meet with Clydeside Action on Asbestos regularly during the Bill's passage in order to ensure that those who suffered from asbestos-related conditions and those who had lost loved ones on account of it would be supported through the course, court process and receive the justice they deserve. I do not believe that the Cabinet Secretary has been able to reassure, reassure Clydeside Action and Asbestos as at 4.15 last Wednesday I was contacted with a request that we resubmit these amendments and I would likely, like to welcome members of CAA to the Public Gallery this afternoon to hear these proceedings. These illnesses caused in many cases through occupational exposure to asbestos fibre of many years ago include mesothelioma, uh, lung cancer, asbestosis and pleural plaques. The victims suffering from these conditions are a legacy of Scotland's industrial history and they deserve this Parliament to give them our full support. 
The government will argue, I expect, that the complexity of asbestos-related conditions will ensure that they will be remitted to the Court of Session and that they cannot be considered by simple procedure. Arguments doubtless that will be raised will about the difficulties of legislating for one group of personal injuries. But I would say to you that the Parliament has already legislated for this specific group of personal injury sufferers by passing legislation brought in by this government in 2009. And I wonder what has changed. Even if it is highly unlikely that asbestos-related cases would be considered under simple procedure or that any case would be heard out with the Court of Session because of the complexity of the case, why not make it clear in this Bill that the exclusive competence will not be applied to asbestos-related cases or considered under simple procedure? What is the harm in providing that reassurance to the sufferers of this industrial disease and to their survivors and families? Amendment 61 disapplies the exclusive competence limit of the Sheriff Court to personal injuries caused by exposure to asbestos. Amendment 65 excludes such cases from being heard under simple procedure. Now, it may be that the amendments at stage two, which prevent any cases raised in the specialist personal injury court being subject to simple procedure, covers the intention of this amendment. And I will listen to what the Cabinet Secretary has to say. But if it does not cover it in its entirety, and I'm not sure that it does, my amendment would prevent any asbestos-related cases being heard under simple procedure. If I can move on to Amendments 7, 8 and 9, these uh, refer to appeals from the personal, court, personal injury court uh, and uh, going to the court of session rather than the sheriff appeal court. Now, these amendments again were defeated by five votes to four at stage two. However, I am still of the opinion that there are compelling arguments for these amendments to be considered and that I have therefore brought them back to the chamber today. The intention in the bill is to set up a specialist personal injury court where cases will be heard by two specialist uh, personal injury sheriffs, not at the same time, I may add, and unless certain con uh, conditions apply, cases will be heard by a jury of 12 people. As the bill stands, appeals against the decisions made by this court could be heard by a sheriff appeal court, court which might consist of one sit sheriff sitting alone, possibly without the specialist expertise in sp personal injury that the original sheriff had. This seems inconsistent, as surely appeals against decisions made by a specialist court should be heard by a specialist court, that being the Court of Session, which of course uh, will be the hearing uh, personal injury cases of a values above the privative limit and will still have that specialism. At stage two, the Minister expressed confidence that the rules of court and the President of the Sheriff Court would ensure that the appropriately constituted court would hear the, the, the appeal. She also argued that section 106 of the bill allows the Sheriff Appeal Court to remit an appeal to the Court of Session. In addition, she argued that Section 102B inserted into the Bill through an a very welcome amendment from John Finney uh, would also help to ensure this. This applies to test proposed by Sheriff Taylor uh, in that in both the Sheriff Court and the Sheriff Appeal Court, the Court must have regard to the difficulty or complexity of the case and what we have termed equality of arms when deciding to sanction the employment of counsel. Finally, the argument was made that there was no justification for treating one category case, personal injury, differently from all others. But that, if that is the case, why is the only specialist court being set up, the personal injury courts? We are treating personal injury as different. These arguments also miss the point that in terms of the principle behind my amendment, it's not actually about equality of arms or what the President of the Sheriff Court is able to do. It's whether it is appropriate for an appeal heard by a specialist, specialist sheriff and a civil jury should potentially be heard by a single sheriff or even three sheriffs, none of whom might be specialist injury sheriffs. I contend that it is not and that these cases should be heard, these appeal cases should be heard in the Court of Session. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, at the outset, Officer, I uh, highlight my declaration to, in the Register of Interests. Um, certainly, I'm certainly very much aware, Cabinet Secretary, that, uh, that all cases that merit counsel will continue to benefit uh, from it, and that's true of the Sheriff Court, the new Personal Injury Court, and also the Sheriff Appeal Court. But also, I'm uh, very much aware of the comments from the Sheriff Principal Taylor at the Justice Committee on the 22nd of April. Uh, where he stated that uh, a, complex, a complex asbestosis case will probably be remitted to the Court of Session. However, even if it were to remain in the Sheriff Court, it would almost certainly merit sanction for counsel. And so certainly with, with those comments, uh, uh, certainly from that have been mentioned in the past, uh, I'm, I'm seeking some assurances uh, that, uh, from the Cabinet Secretary to provide uh, the, the issue that uh, certainly for those cases that, have, that are asbestos-related cases, uh, that, that they both will receive the funding that, uh, for counsel that they require, but also secondly, that, uh, that they can uh, revert to the Court of Session due to the, the, the complex nature of asbestos cases.
Welcome to Zoom. Um, I would like to welcome uh, Clydeside Action uh, for asbestos to the gallery and pay tribute to their great campaign. But of course, asbestos-related illness doesn't just apply in Clydeside. And I myself have written to the Justice Secretary uh, about one of my own constituents affected uh, by asbestos in that particular way. And I think the answer that members want, the answer that um, um, asbestos, Clydeside Action for Asbestos in the gallery want, is the answer to three questions which really have been put uh, very uh, uh, succinctly and effectively by Elaine Murray. Firstly, what is the harm in doing what Elaine Murray is proposing in her amendments? Secondly, what is the answer to the question about exceptional circumstances? Because we already treat asbestos as an exceptional circumstance, and the legislation that we passed in 2009 uh, bears testimony to that. And if still the Cabinet Secretary does not accept the amendments being put forward by Elaine Murray, can he at least tell us what he has done to fulfil the commitment he made at committee to ease the test uh, for remit from the Sheriff Court uh, to uh, the Court uh, of Session? Uh, I support the amendments in Elaine Murray's name, and I hope at the last minute the Cabinet Secretary will have a change of mind. Margaret. Presiding officer, um, if I could address Amendment 7, 8 and 9 first, it seems entirely logical that a claim is to be heard, um, that if a claim is to be heard in a specialist court, then an appeal from that court should be able to be heard in the court of session, and it's then up to the court of session to grant disposal as it seems fit. So happy to support these amendments in Elaine Murray's name. However, while I have huge and immense sympathy with the intention behind Amendment 61 and 65, then section 88 does already allow the Sheriff to remit proceedings to the Court of Session if the importance or difficulty of the proceedings makes it appropriate to do so. And I think it would be wrong to single out asbestos cases. And the distinction between these cases and what is the category of um, personal injury cases seems to me the wide-ranging um, amount of different cases within that category. Christine Graham. Uh, I rise simply, uh, presiding officer, to say my recollection is that the committee took the view, as just uh, elucidated by Margaret Mitchell, that while we have huge sympathy for the asbestosis cases, that we didn't want to select one category out from all other kinds of injury cases that may arise from employment against all others that may arise now or in the future. And that was the reason we did not support the amendment at that stage. And I seem to remember all members agreed with that position then. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government Ministers have every and indeed great sympathy with those suffering from asbestos-related diseases in their families, and I think we've heard that uh, from around uh, the Chamber. Uh, clearly, concerns have been expressed, but we've also heard points made by Christine Graham and others. But let me try and give uh, Stuart McMillan the reassurance that he desires. Uh, I know that he, along with Clydeside Action, have been tenacious in looking after the interests of those who have suffered. We have legislated to ensure that a person dying from mesothelioma can receive damages without preventing members of their family making a future claim. We have also supported legislation that clarifies Scots law as it relates to damages for fatal personal injuries. Amendments 61 and 65 argue that due to the complexity of personal injury cases caused by exposure to asbestos, these cases should be treated differently from other cases. Amendment 61 would result in all damages claims in respect of personal injuries caused by exposure to asbestos below 100,000 being able to remain competent in the court of session. And Amendment 65 would result in cases below £5,000 being excluded from being dealt with under the new simple procedure. And I fully acknowledge that asbestos cases can be complex cases. On whether they should all be able to be raised in the court of session, regardless of value, I agree with Sheriff Principal Taylor, who said that, and I quote, a complex asbestosis case will probably be remitted to the court of session. However, even if it were to remain in the Sheriff Court, it would almost certainly merit sanction for counsel, close quote. The government believes that all cases that merit counsel will continue to benefit from it. That is true of the Sheriff Court, the new personal injury court, and the Sheriff Appeal Court. Section 102B of the Bill, inserted by an amendment by John Finney at Stage 2, has secured this position by putting the test recommended by Sheriff Principal Taylor for sanction for counsel on the face of the Bill. It enshrines the equality of arms principle and addresses the concerns about access to appropriate legal representation 
in complex cases in the Sheriff Court. An amendment similar to Amendment 61 to exclude actions for damages and personal injury asbestosis cases from the exclusive competence was tabled by John Pentland at Stage 2. That amendment was withdrawn on the basis that the content of the Bill on sanction for Council was improved, as I have already outlined. Members of the committee, including Margaret Mitchell, raised concerns regarding treating some types of complex cases any differently from others. As the convener stated at stage two, and I quote, I have huge sympathy for the amendment, but if we take one group and say that it is special, another group will come along and say that it is special too, close quotes. Amendment 65 would result in cases below 5,000 being excluded from being dealt with under the new simple procedure. Sections 70A and 75A of the Bill, inserted again by amendments by John Finney at Stage 2, will allow cases below 5,000 where appropriate to be heard in the personal injury court and not be subject to simple procedure. Under the powers in the Bill, the Scottish Civil Justice Council is able to make specialist rules in personal injury cases and also in personal injury cases under simple procedure. The Government believes that all cases that merit Council will continue to benefit from the expertise of Council. Most asbestosis-related disease cases, even those of relatively low financial value, will fall into this category. Where these cases are heard in the Sheriff Courts or the Specialist Personal Injury Court, the Sheriff, who will all the facts before him or her, is best placed to decide whether sanction for Council is appropriate. Amendment 79 are a package. Similar amendments were tabled by Elaine Murray at Stage 2. The amendments would mean that all appeals against final decisions by the Personal Injury Court would be heard in the Court of Session, rather than the Sheriff Appeal Court. Decisions of the Personal Injury Court, which did not constitute final judgment, would continue to go to the Sheriff Appeal Court. It is an important principle of Lord Gill's review that courts have the flexibility to allocate the right judicial resources to the right courts, which is why he recommended the establishment of a Sheriff Appeal Court to deal with all appeals from the Sheriff Courts. And I am confident that the rules of court and the President of the Sheriff Appeal Court will ensure that an appropriately constituted bench will hear all appeals a bench that will be made up from among the six sheriffs principal and other appeal sheriffs who will all be experienced sheriffs of over five years. There may be concern about the complexity of a personal injury appeal, and I understand that this may be a particular issue following Section 69 of the Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Act 2013, which removes automatic civil liability for breach of statutory health and safety duties. The bill permits an appeal to be remitted to the Court of Session by the Sheriff Appeal Court on the application of one of the parties, if satisfied that the appeal raises a complex or novel point of law. I oppose Elaine Murray's amendments and believe that we have satisfied the concerns that Stuart Macmillan and others have espoused. Thank you. I now call Elaine Murray, Murray to wind up the debate and to indicate whether you wish to press or withdraw amendment number 61. Thank you, presiding officer. Can I first of all clarify what happened at stage two? John Pentland withdrew his amendment. He said he was doing that for the time being because we were promised that other amendments would address all his concerns and indeed would address the concerns of Clydeside Action on Asbestos. Now, they, they Clydeside Action on Asbestos, are the experts on this issue uh, and they were not reassured and they did ask for these, re these amendments to be reconsidered at stage three in the light of the bill as amended. As I said earlier, we already rightly legislated for asbestosis-related conditions separately in 2009. We have recognised in this Parliament there are specific issues around this, uh, the, this particular form of personal injury, which is uh, uh, really the, uh, the result of a, a shameful industrial legacy, which the Scottish legal system must uh, serve justly, fairly and with the utmost efficiency. I believe that the victims of this condition and their families are entitled to the sort of assurances which my amendments uh, present in this bill. 
Can I say again on the issue of the personal injury court, this is still, in my view, about the level of specialism which has to exist uh, in the appeal court when it is hearing an appeal against the judgment of a specialist court. I, th I think it is only appropriate that another court with a si similar level of expertise is able to hear that uh, that appeal and I uh, therefore continue to support my amendments on that and I will continue uh, to press uh, amendment 61. The question is then amendment number 61 will be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. If PAMT is not agreed there will be a division as this is the first division of the stage. The PAMT is suspended for five minutes.
Thank you. We now proceed with the division on amendment number 61. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 61 is as follows. Yes, 31. No, 81. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. We now move to the next group, which is group number four, all Scotland jurisdiction, concurrency with local jurisdiction. Those who are leaving the chamber, I'd be grateful if you could do so quickly and quietly. I now call amendments number 20, in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with amendments number 22, 23, 27, 30 and 40, I'll give a very short suspension to allow the gallery to be cleared. I now call Amendment 20 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary Group with Amendments number 22, 23, 27, 30 and 40. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment number 20 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Section 41 provides that the Scottish Ministers may make an order providing for the jurisdiction of a sheriff of a specified sheriffdom sitting at a specified sheriff court to extend throughout Scotland for specified kinds of civil proceedings. And this section allows the setting up of the specialist All Scotland Personal Injury Sheriff Court. As the bill stands, it is not clear that a designated All Scotland Personal Injury Court is, in relation to personal injury cases, still able to sit and function as a local sheriff court. Amendment 20 clarifies this, and the other amendments are consequentials. Thus, a designated specialist sheriff court could deal with a personal injury case in two ways, either as a specialist All Scotland court or as a local sheriff court. Subsection 5 leaves the choice up to the pursuer. Subsection 6 preserves the sheriff's power to overrule if the sheriff considers that it would be better dealt with by the specialist All Scotland court or the local court, as the case may be. I move Amendment 20. Thank you. Um, as no other person has requested to speak, uh, the question is that Amendment 20 be agreed to, assuming you don't have anything further to say. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. Thank you. So we now move to Group 5. And I call Amendment 62 in the name of Margaret Mitchell, Group with Amendment 63 and 64. Margaret Mitchell, to move Amendment 62 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. 
I'll move um, Amendment 62 at the beginning to ensure I don't forget, pres uh, Presiding Officer. Amendment 62 is consequential to Amendment 63. The effect of these amendments would be to ensure the de facto seniority of appeal sharers is duly recognised when any decision that they may make in their capacity as sheriff um, section 49 subsection 4 is appealed in the Sheriff Appeal Court. The amendment provides that these appeal cases would be heard either by a Sheriff Principal or a Senator of the College, uh, College of Justice who also hold office as appeal sheriffs. This is to satisfy the Gill Review um, recommendation and view that it would be inappropriate for an appellate court to consist of members of the same level of judicial hierarchy as those from whom an appeal is marked. These amendments take on board the comments made by the Cabinet Secretary at Stage 2 when I attempted to address this concern. In particular, the Cabinet Secretary questioned the availability of resources with regard to the Stage 2 amendments I lodged then in an attempt to address this issue. I emphasise, therefore, that Amendments 62 and 63 will place little or no additional burden on the resources of the court system. Also at Stage 2, the Cabinet Secretary emphasised that the Bill proposes that the Sheriff Appeal Court should hear not only civil appeals from the Sheriff Court, but summary criminal appeals also, and that the appeal sheriffs will be highly qualified and experienced, experienced judges and will have the appropriate expertise. On the strength of these remarks, Amendment 64 requires the candidates of the role of appeal sheriff must appear to the Lord President to have a high level of legal knowledge and experience in both civil and criminal law and practice. Many thanks. Now call Dr. Elaine Murray. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Yeah, I, I'd like to rise to support these amendments. I believe they are in the same spirit as my Amendment 7 to 9, uh, requiring an appropriate level of expertise in the Sheriff Court, uh, and we will be supporting them. Thanks. And now call the Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> Deputy Presiding Officer, Amendments 62 and 63 severely restrict the choice of judges in the Sheriff Appeal Court who can appear, hear appeals which arise from a case that was initially heard by a sheriff who is also an appeal sheriff. While there is no suggestion that the same judge would hear the appeal, it would be a logistical problem to ensure that in these cases, without regard to complexity or importance, such an appeal could only be heard by a sheriff principal. There are only six, assuming all are in post, or a former appeals sheriff who had also been a sheriff principal, of which there are and will not be many. The Sheriff Appeal Court may deal with a variety of appeals from straightforward procedural issues to weighty matters of legal uncertainty. As such, the Bill empowers the President of the Court to determine which judge or judges sit on the bench in any one case and empowers the Court of Session to set out in rules of court the quorum of judges required for particular sittings of the court. This amendment will cut across that flexibility, imposing a rule that will severely curtail the number of judges which may be deployed, and it is easy to see delays occurring. Subsection 2AC of Amendment 63 does not make sense in terms of the Bill. It purports to allow a Court of Session judge who ceased to act as an appeal sheriff under the provision in Schedule 1A to be one of the restrictive categories of judge, provided they have been reappointed as re-employed appeal sheriffs under Section 50. The Bill does not permit this. Schedule 1A expressly provides that a Court of Session judge is not eligible for appointment under Section 50 as a re-employed former appeal sheriff. Amendment 64 displays a lack of trust in the judiciary of Scotland that I do not share. It requires that appeal sheriffs appointed under Section 49 must not only have been sheriffs for five years, as currently provided for, but also, in the Lord President's view, have a high level of legal knowledge and experience, particularly in civil and criminal law and practice. This amendment presumes that not all sheriffs have a high level of legal knowledge. This undermines the reputation of the judiciary in Scotland, and I take issue with that. It suggests a lack of trust in the Lord President that he might appoint someone to the role of appeal sheriff who had neither of these things. 
I trust the Lord President to appoint suitable sheriffs to be appeal sheriffs and find it worrying that Margaret Mitchell does not. I oppose amendments 62, 63 and 64. Thank you. A late request to speak from Graham Pearson, which will, of course, allow me to give the right to Cabinet Secretary to respond, should he so wish. Mr. Pearson. Thank you, President Officer. It's a, a, a matter of clarity. Uh, Dr. Murray had indicated our support of the amendments, uh, but for clarity, it's, uh, Amendment 62 and 63 we support. We believe that 64 is unnecessary. Cabinet Secretary, have you any further to add? Any requirement. Thank you. And so I call on Margaret Mitchell to wind up and press or withdraw her amendments. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm not persuaded by the Cabinet Secretary's argument. Rather than restricting the choice of judges, the amendments 62 and 63 address the, the major point, the fundamental point made by Lord Gill, namely that it is um, entirely inappropriate the, for, a, for an appellate court to consist of members of the same level of the judicial hierarchy as those from whom an appeal is marked. In terms of Amendment 64, it seems to me this merely puts in place the same experience must be a prerequisite for sheriff courts um, appeal judges as is required when appointing sheriff principals. Uh -huh. Thanks. And so the question is... That Amendment 62 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not, so there will therefore be a one minute division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 62 is yes 43, no 68. There were no abstentions and the amendment is therefore agreed. No. Not agreed, forgive me, not agreed. <laughs> right. I now call amendment 63 in the name of Margaret Mitchell. Already debated with amendment 62, Margaret Mitchell to move or not? Moved. Thank you. Else. So the question is that Amendment 63 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not. There will therefore be a division. Please vote now. The result of the vote in amendment number 63 is yes 44, no 67. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And I now call amendment 64 in the name of Margaret Mitchell, already debated with amendment 62. Margaret Mitchell, to move or not? Moved. Thank you. So the question is that amendment 64 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not. Please vote now. Thank you. 
Result of the vote on amendment number 64 is yes, 12, no, 100. There were no abstentions and the amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendments 21, 22, 23 and 24, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated, and I now invite the Cabinet Secretary to move these amendments on block. Moved on block. And does any member object to a single question being put on these amendments? Good. So as no member objects, the question is that amendments 21 to 24 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you very much. And so I now call Amendment 65 in the name of Elaine Murray, already debated with Amendment 61. Dr Murray to move or not? Moved. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 65 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not. There will therefore be a division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 65 is yes, 40, no, 71. There were no abstentions, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendments 25 to 30, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated, and I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move amendments 25 to 30 on block, please. On block. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on these amendments? As no member does, the question is that amendments 25 to 30 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you. Which takes us to Group 6. And I now call Amendment 5 in the name of Dr Elaine Murray, grouped with Amendments 1, 6 and 2. I draw members' attention to the note on the groupings. Amendments 5 and 1 are direct alternatives. That means I can call both amendments. If Amendment 5 is agreed to, the Parliament can then still decide whether to agree to Amendment 1. If it did so, Amendment 1 would replace Amendment 5. The same applies to Amendment 6 and 2. I hope that's clear. Dr Elaine Murray, to move Amendment 5 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. At Stage 2, I submitted an amendment arguing that the three months' time limit in the Bill should commence at the time the applicant became aware of the grounds for an appeal rather than the time when those grounds arose. The Minister for Community Safety argued uh, that this would be a subjective test and could lead to legal arguments uh, about when the requisite knowledge had actually been acquired and that that could protract proceedings unnecessarily. As this approach had been uh, rejected on those grounds, my amendments today would extend the period for an application for judicial review from three to six months. The committee heard a range of views from witnesses on the time limit, several arguing that three months was insufficient time to put together a case and secure funding, particularly in the case of appeals from the community groups. But on the other hand, of course, it is desirable that judicial reviews should be made promptly and resolved quickly, but this should not be at the expense of fairness. The Minister also made, uh, made the point at stage three that the three months operates satisfactorily in England and Wales. However, his co her, her colleague Rod Roderick Campbell informed the committee that judicial review is much less common in Scotland than it is in England and Wales. Therefore, I contend that the time limit can be extended to ensure fairness to applicants where an appeal may be more complicated. Circumstances where community groups are involved or where securing funding for an appeal is not straightforward. Six months, therefore, seems a sen sensible compromise considering the different opinions that the committee heard from witnesses. My feeling is that 12 months is too long uh, and could result in a very protracted review process uh, and that six months is the appropriate length of time under these circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Alice McInnes to speak to Amendment 1 and other amendments in the group, please. Thank you very much. Um, setting a three months time limit for applications for ju judicial review is needlessly restrictive and will erode access to justice. As Elaine Murray has just said, her amendments seek to raise it to six months. My amendments 1 and 2 seek to go further and extend this time limit from three to 12 months. Now, during the committee's consideration of this bill, a significant number of witnesses and organisations told us that these provisions currently in the bill are fundamentally imbalanced. 
Jonathan Mitchell QC said the proposed three-month limit would be unique in Scotland. It's far more restrictive than others such as exist, such as the three years permitted to claim after a road accident or the five years for a contract dispute. And it provides insufficient time to assemble the case and secure funding. It is reasonable to expect that community groups would take longer than is being proposed to marshal a case, given the need to gather, discuss options and agree upon a course of action. And the evidence we received also indicated that such a short period of time would present real challenges to those who require legal aid or who need to find a solicitor willing to act pro bono or for a reduced fee. Presiding officer, although the time limit can be waived, the current limit will still prevent the proper exploration of alternative dispute resolution. Pursuers will be hurried into an appeal almost immediately or commence proceedings to preserve their position. And the presumptive limit is likely to unreasonably put others off exploring judicial review altogether. The Legal Services Agency tell us that the lesson from England and Wales is that a three-month deadline operating there is very tight. And that's in spite of the fact that petitioners in England and Wales enjoy a comparative wealth of ex expertise and resources that simply doesn't exist in Scotland because of our weaker history in this area. Rather than ride roughshod over the 12-month limits currently contained in the Human Rights Act 1998 and the Scotland Act, I believe it would be appropriate to bring this legislation in line with those acts. Justice Scotland, Friends of the Earth, the Environmental Law Centre for Scotland and legal services agencies all agree. Ministers have repeatedly told us that there's a public interest in judicial review challenges being made promptly and resolved quickly. But judicial review is the public's last opportunity to contest acts of state and ensure public bodies do not exceed or abuse their jurisdiction. And it's certainly not in their interest to risk undermining a just and proportionate process in the pursuit of undue haste. And I move my, if appropriate, I move my amendment. Many thanks. Now Colin Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I refer to my declaration of interest as a member of the Faculty of Advocates? Um, first of all, can I accept that the existing common law situation, the requirement to plead mora taciturnity and acquiescence uh, in issues on delay in judicial review petitions is no longer fit for purpose? And I agree with Elaine Murray that Scotland is not overburdened by the volume of petitions for judicial review outside immigration and asylum. And clearly, the climate's different. But if we are going to have a time limit, what time limit should we have? Is three months too restrictive? Well, clearly, it's uh, a shock to the system and will be a shock to the system for practitioners. Uh, and it's certainly low compared to, with other time limits uh, in the system, for example, as Alison McInnes has mentioned in Human Rights Action. Nevertheless, we heard evidence in committee about the merits of a pre-action protocol, and that's something certainly that the Scottish Civil Justice Council can look at. And also we heard evidence from Lindsay Montgomery of the Scottish Legal Aid Board that where there is uh, an issue about funding legal aid for a judicial review petition, then a SLAB can deal with sp special urgency cases in 1.1 day on average. Uh, and also, as we've heard reference, there is a, a provision in Section 85 of the Bill that the Court can extend the period where it considers it equitable. So there is a fallback position. If I were persuaded that uh, this time limit would deny access to justice for a significant number of people, I would oppose it. I'm not so persuaded. Many thanks. I now call on Margaret Mitchell. Um, I share Alison McInnes's concern that three months may not give community groups adequate time to organise themselves, marshal their arguments and crucially secure funding, thereby restricting access to justice. My preference, therefore, would be for the 12-month limit. However, six months is obviously still preferable to the three months as a time limit for judicial review. Thank you. And Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Simply uh, to echo what my colleague Roddy Campbell said, I didn't know he was going to speak on this particular amendment, but the actual uh, 85 and it's, sub, it's section 27A1 subsection B says the period of three months beginning with the date on which the grounds giving rise to the application first arise or, I emphasise or, such longer period as the court considers equitable, having regard to all the circumstances. Had that not been there, I would have the same concerns as colleagues across the other benches, but there is always discretion at the court to look at all the facts and circumstances of that application. Many thanks. Cabinet Secretary. Both these sets of amendments significantly extend the time limit suggested in Lord Gill's review, at one to six months and the other to 12 months. There is a public interest in judicial review challenges being made promptly and resolved quickly. 
73% of the respondents to the Scottish Civil Courts Review consultation thought it needed reforming. It should be possible to challenge public authorities' decisions, but if made appropriately, they should not be delayed. A balance has to be struck. The time limit is drafted to provide fairness uh, to applicants, whilst reflecting the public interest in having settled decision-making. The Bill recognises that there might be occasions when that time limit needs to be extended and gives the Court discretion to do so, given all the circumstances. Lord Gill recommended a three-month time limit. It is a time limit, as others have said, that has operated satisfactorily in England for some considerable time. The Scottish Government consulted on this and a majority of the respondents were in favour. In their evidence to the committee at Stage 1, this limit was supported by Sheriff Principal Taylor and Lord Gill. During Stage 1, anxieties were raised about whether legal aid could be arranged within this timescale. But Lindsay Montgomery of the Scottish Legal Aid Board assured the committee that this would not present a problem. Indeed, applications could be made under the Legal Aid Special Urgency provisions if required. At Stage 2, ASDA, supported by the Scottish Retail Consortium, campaigned for a shorter period of six weeks for planning cases and sponsored an amendment lodged by Margaret Mitchell, which was withdrawn. We considered ASDA's case very carefully before opposing that amendment. We are aware that delays in planning cases can have serious consequences, both for the applicant and for the local and or national economy. In its written evidence to the Justice Committee, ASDA made it plain that delays result in lost investment, delays in local job creation, financial impacts on the building industry and uncertainty in the overall viability of the project. We finally opposed that amendment because we were aware of the sensitivities that the committee had expressed about three months and because we were satisfied that a simple, straightforward and consistent time limit should apply to all applications, and the Lord President concurred. However, an increase in the time limit to 26 weeks or 52 weeks brings all ASDA's arguments into play, and it is not in Scotland's interest to introduce further delays by longer time limits. And if you are not swayed by the argument in the case of a supermarket, consider the effect of delays in planning developments for schools and hospitals in your constituencies. Similar delays would affect them and the local communities they serve if the time limit is extended. And even at the individual level, longer time limits are a problem. An everyday example would be a person granted planning permission for the extension to their house that should at some point be entitled to build it without fear that permission will be quashed or judicial review. Six or 12 months is a long time for an individual to wait for certainty. In addition, the longer the time, the higher the legal fees are likely to be. For these reasons, I oppose Alison McInnes's and Elaine Murray's amendments and would ask Dr Murray to withdraw Amendment 5. Dr Murray. I think I failed to move Amendment 5 uh, during my speech, which I do now. Thank you. And so the question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not. There will therefore be a division, and this will be a 60-second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number five is yes, 50, no, 61. There were no abstentions and the amendment is therefore not agreed.
I now call Amendment 1 in the name of Alison McInnes, already debated with Amendment 5. Alison McInnes, to move or not move? Move. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not. There will therefore be a division. 30 seconds. Please vote now. Result of the vote on amendment number one is yes, 17, no, 93, and there were no abstentions, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. Call now amendment six in the name of Dr. Elaine Murray. Already debated with amendment five. Dr. Murray to move or not move? Presiding officer, as the uh, bill would be inconsistent if six were moved, it will not be moved. Not moved. Thank you very much. And so I call amendment two in the name of Alison McInnes. Already debated with Amendment 5, Alison McInnes, to move or not? Not moved. Thank you. So we'll now move to Group 7. And I call Amendment 66 in the name of Margaret Mitchell, grouped with Amendments 67 and 68. Margaret Mitchell, to move Amendment 66 and speak to all other amendments in the group, please. I move Amendment 66, Presiding Officer. This amendment removes the real prospect of success test, which was criticised by the Law Society of Scotland and other respondents at earlier stages of this legislative process. It replaces this test with statable case and is supported by the Law Society of Scotland. Amendment 68 is consequential to Amendment 66. A real prospect of success test is subjective in nature and, as respondents have pointed out, crucially restricts access to justice, which goes against the spirit of this bill and the Gill Review. Statable case, on the other hand, suggests that an applicant must have reasonable grounds for making an application for judicial review, which is a much fairer and less arbitrary test. Furthermore, Given the importance of the permission stage, which prevents unmeritorious applications from proceeding to a hearing on their respective merits, Amendment 67 introduced the third test, which specifically precludes cases which are frivolous, vexatious or wholly without merit, merit from being granted permission for judicial review. These cases use up considerable court time and financial resources. As a further safeguard against this occurring, members may recall that at stage two, and the Cabinet Secretary has already referred to this, I tabled two amendments that addressed a specific concern of the business community that judicial review is frequently used by commercial rivals to delay development proposals for competitors. Clearly, this has ramifications for investments and job creation in local communities. At the time, members and the Minister, while sympathetic to the intention behind the amendments lodged, then expressed concern that the proposed time limit of six week weeks went too far. Amendment 67 has therefore the additional advantage of providing an alternative approach to prevent this problem from occurring through the exclusion of vexatious applications. Okay, thanks, Dr Murray. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I had a, a couple of uh, points really ab about this. I don't recall this being discussed particularly at stage two. I'm puzzled as to what a uh, statable case would be, because surely a case could be statable but not actually be reasonable, not have very, very much prospect of success. I, I, I presume the, um, uh, Ms. Mitchell's support of the 12 month limit would actually be to enable this type of uh, requirement to be operable. Uh, but I do wonder whether there's any assessment be, been done at all regarding what the consequence would be for court time if th this test was uh, changed in this way. Cabinet Secretary. 
Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Margaret Mitchell's Amendment 66 to 68 will lower the threshold at the permission stage of a judicial review case from a real prospect of success uh, to statable and not frivolous, vexatious or wholly without merit. Amendment 67 is unnecessary. If a case is statable, it is by definition not frivolous, vexatious or wholly without merit. As for Amendments 66 and 68, Lord Gill's review proposed the wording inverted commas, real prospect of success, close inverted commas, currently found in the Bill. Lord Gill's recommendation, which was arrived at after careful assessment and consideration and the Government agreed, Margaret Mitchell's amendment would remove that wording. The phrase, real prospect of success, encapsulates the concept that a case should not proceed if it is unmeritorious, frivolous or vexatious. But it goes further, setting out that a case should only proceed if it is actually, instead of just potentially, arguable. It does not mean that the litigant must show they will actually win, but it allows the court to prevent cases proceeding that are based on fanciful arguments, assessing them able to proceed only where there is a realistic chance that it will succeed. Margaret Mitchell's amendment, and I think this is a point being raised by Lane Murray, sets the permission bar too low, and it will not allow the court to weed out cases unlikely to succeed, but only those wholly unstatable. To put this in context, the test of whether a case is statable is the test any lawyer would require to apply currently prior to raising any case in court. A refusal of permission is not an arbitrary decision of the court. The bill envisages permission being sought firstly on the basis of paperwork reviewable at an oral hearing, which if again refused may be appealed to the inner house. In short, if a case is potentially arguable, but after up to a potential of three separate assessments by the court at permission stage, it still does not appear to have a real prospect of success, the government's position is that the case should not be allowed to proceed through to a full hearing. The use of language here is also key to ensuring certainty in the application of the law in granting permission. As Lord Gill sets out, that the test of real prospect of success is one which has been in operation in England and Wales for some time. Further, the test is already employed in the Court of Session as part of its assessment of whether to grant a protected expenses order in certain cases. Real prospect of success is therefore an established concept with a substantial body of case law from which the Court of Session can draw on in determining applications for permission giving a degree of certainty to public bodies, developers and litigants alike as to whether a judicial review action is likely to succeed. And I referred to Margaret Mitchell's support for ASDA's views on judicial review earlier. One of ASDA's concerns was that judicial review was being used as a delaying tactic by competitors. The combination of the introduction of a time limit and a permission to proceed stage is a package recommended by Lord Gill to obviate unnecessary delays in judicial review and the associated uncertainty and costs. The permission stage, with its test of a real prospect of success, is essential as an effective tool in filtering out cases that are not actually arguable. Margaret Mitchell's amendments merely maintain the status quo. For these reasons, Margaret Mitchell's amendments should not be adopted. Thank you. So, Margaret Mitchell, to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment. Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. The statable case test answer um, Elaine Murray's uh, inquiry or, uh, or question is a legal term and it's supported by the Law Society of Scotland as the real prospect of success test in their view and in the view of other respondents during the legislative um, process uh, serves only to realistically restrict access to, to judges, hence the, the reason for Amendment um, 67 and 66. The delays to which the Cabinet Secretary already referred, which affect the business community and impact on their local economy and investment and job creation, would, I submit, uh, still be a real prospect and something which could still damage um, business if these amendments were not agreed to. Thank you. To press or withdrawing your amendment? Forgive me, I didn't hear you. Sorry, no, move amendment 66. Right, thank you. So the question is that amendment 66 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not. There will therefore be a division. Please vote now, 60 seconds.
The result of the vote on Amendment No. 66 is yes, 13, no, 96. There were no abstentions, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call Amendment 67 in the name of Margaret Mitchell. Margaret Mitchell to move or not. Moved, Presiding Officer. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 67 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not. There will therefore be a division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on Amendment No. 67 is yes, 13, no, 96. There were no abstentions, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. So I now call Amendment 68 in the name of Margaret Mitchell. Margaret Mitchell to move or not? Not moved, Presiding Not moved, thank you. So I now call Amendments 31, 32, 33, and 34, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. And I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move these amendments on block. Moved on block. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on these amendments? And as it appears that no member objects, the question is that Amendment 31 to 34 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Many thanks. So we now move to Group 8 and call, amendments four, call Amendment 14 in the name of Graham Pearson. Group to Amendment 15, Mr Pearson, to move Amendment 14 and speak to both amendments in the group, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I move Amendment 14, uh, and Amendment 14 and 15 are aimed at dealing with the overriding objective of the Bill. Amendment 14 seeks to place court users at the centre of the rulemaking process and, indeed, the overall operation of the courts. Uh, if Amendment 14 is not accepted, I will thereafter move Amendment 15 as a compromise to those members who have argued that Amendment 14 is unduly restrictive on judicial discretion, albeit I do not agree that this is the case. Uh, we on this side of the Chamber agree with the Law Society of Scotland that this legislation has the opportunity to establish the overriding objective uh, that the civil procedure in Scotland should adopt. This would be similar to the approach taken by the Wolf Review in England and Wales. Amendment 14 mirrors the overriding objective as recorded in England and Wales. We believe that a principle-led approach such as this would be more effective for court users. The Law Society in their written evidence made the point that such an approach can encourage parties to resolve cases by alternative dispute resolution and I hold that that would be a good outcome. At stage two, the government sought to dismiss these amendments as not necessary. If members are of the view that these factors are already taken into account by the judiciary, then I urge you to support my amendment to ensure that this is the case in all cases. If we agree that these factors should underpin our justice system, why leave it to judicial discretion whether or not they are taken into account in practice in all cases? Our role is not to unduly fetter judicial discretion. These amendments do not seek to do this. But we do have a duty to ensure our justice system operates fairly. It is not sufficient to, deter, to defer responsibility to the Scottish Civil Justice Council on such a fundamental matter. This requires, in my view, a parliamentary accountability. The government members have supported in the past the concept that a written constitution was necessary to set out the principles the people of Scotland would live by. I would therefore hope they would agree with me a similar approach would benefit our civil justice system. I move the amendment. Many thanks. Now, Colin Margaret Mitchell. Yeah. While I support the intention behind Graham Pearson's Amendment 14, I do share the concern that some of my committee members expressed, um, some my fellow committee members expressed at stage two that it, this list is too restrictive. 
Uh, also in terms of Amendment 15, at stage two, the Minister reassured the committee that the Scottish um, Civil Justice Council has already adopted this principle. Um, so in, in these circumstances, it would look as though the amendment was unnecessary, although I am sympathetic to the intention behind the amendment for the court to conduct proceedings justly, um, as surely this is at the very essence of what it does. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Amendments seek in different ways to ensure that civil court rules are made and interpreted in light of an overriding principle that cases be dealt with justly. Uh, we agree with the principle, but don't think it appropriate to set this out in primary legislation. Uh, the Act establishing the civil, Scottish Civil Justice Council, as Margaret Mitchell was saying, provides that in carrying out its functions, the Council must have regard to the principle that the civil justice system should be, and I quote, fair, accessible and efficient. The Council's Rules Rewrite Working Group in its interim report sets out that it is considering a statement of principle in the rules to indicate that their purpose is to, and I again quote, provide parties with a just resolution of their dispute in accordance with their substantive rights within a reasonable time, in a fair manner with due regard to economy, proportionality and the efficient use of the resources of the parties and of the court, and that parties are expected to comply with the rules. As the Council has already adopted the principle, I ask the Member not to press his amendments. I can't but help agree with the convener of the Justice Committee who said at stage two, and I quote, frankly, I think that the amendments are unnecessary. In my experience, Christine Gray went on to say, the bench takes these matters into account. Indeed, I would be most concerned if proceedings in our share of courts, our lower courts or the court of session were not conducted justly. I have to say, I fully agree and concur with those sentiments. Thank you. And so, Mr Pearson, to wind up and press a withdrawal amendment, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I understand all the sentiments that have been expressed in the Chamber today, but I do believe fundamentally that if we wish to persuade the uh, communities across Scotland that these systems operate in their interests, then our declaration and legislation of the principles that we adhere to and hold so dearly uh, would add weight to our uh, uh, commitment. Uh, although uh, I welcome the uh, commitment from the uh, Justice Council uh, to commit to writing the principles by which they will apply the standards, uh, the Justice Council is not democratically accountable to the people of Scotland. We are. And therefore, I see the commitment within the bill would show the responsibilities that we bear in this matter, and I will press, press the motion. Many thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. If we are not, there will therefore be a division. Please vote now. This will be a 60-second division. Result of the vote on amendment number 14 is yes, 32, no, 78. There were no abstentions, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. Now call amendment 15 in the name of Graham Pearson, already debated with amendment 14. Mr Pearson, to move or not? Uh, move, please. Thank you. So the question is that amendment 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not, so there will be a division. Please vote now.
result of the vote on amendment number 15 is yes 32 no 65 there were 12 abstentions the amendment is therefore not agreed and we now move to group nine and I call amendment 35 in the name of the cabinet secretary grouped with amendments 39 and 58 and I call on minister Rosanna Cunningham to move amendment 35 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, amendment uh, 39 confers functions on the Scottish Courts and Tribunals Service to make payment of the salary of the Chair of the Scottish Land Court, to determine and make payment of the salary of the other members of that court, and to determine and make payment of the expenses of the members of that court. The power to carry out these functions currently lies with Scottish Ministers, and the amendments provide that they are to be carried out by the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service upon its establishment. Provision is also made in the, amendments for the, uh, in the amendment for the determination and payment of the salaries of the clerks and other employees of the court and for the payment of the court's administrative expenses, though in those cases the functions remain with the Scottish Ministers. Uh, Presiding officer, the Scottish Land Court differs from other courts and tribunals in that it is currently not the responsibility of the Scottish Court Service nor the Scottish Tribunal Service. In the longer term, we will be consulting on an order under the Judiciary and Courts 2008 Act to bring the court within the ambit of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. This was previously discussed when the 2008 Act was going through Parliament. Amendments to the administration of judicial salaries do, however, have to be made in primary legislation, hence their inclusion in this bill. Without this amendment, there would be a rather anomalous situation where the administration of the salaries for the land court members remains with Scottish ministers, whilst SCTS undertook this function for all other judicial offices. Amendment 35 adds the Scottish land court to the list of Scottish courts in respect of which the Scottish ministers may make provision for charging fees under section 102A uh, subsection 1. This is linked to the transfer to the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service of the functions relating to remuneration and expenses in the Scottish Land Court and to the longer term aim of bringing the court wholly within the ambit of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service for administration purposes. Amendment 58 is a purely technical amendment that amends the long title of the bill to reflect the new provisions about the Scottish Land Court and I move Amendment 35. Many thanks. And I call Dr Lane Murray. Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. Yet again, I have no intention of opposing these amendments, but I wonder why this has come to light at stage three, rather having, than having been in the bill from the beginning, from stage one. Minister. Um, the, uh, uh, the question is the same as the question uh, uh, asked of my colleague earlier, and the answer is basically the same as, I would, uh, as my colleague gave, uh, uh, gave earlier, in that uh, uh, eagle eyes have picked it up. Um, and uh, uh, in those circumstances, I'm sure the member would rather it was fixed than not. Thank you. Um, so, the question is that Amendment 35 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. So, we'll now move to Group 10, and I call Amendment 69 in the name of Alison McInnes, Group with Amendments 70, 71, 72, 16, 17, and 18. And Alison McInnes to move Amendment 69 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. The very significant increase in the privative jurisdiction of the Sheriff Court from 5,000 to 100,000 will have a considerable impact upon many litigants who currently choose to bring their cases in the Court of Session. Not only will it compel them to proceed in the Sheriff Court, it will limit their ability to instruct counsel. In the Court of Session, a litigant who is awarded expenses against another party will automatically recover the expenses of instructing counsel. This is not the position in the Sheriff Court, where the expenses of instructing counsel are recoverable only if the Sheriff has sanctioned the employment of counsel. Excuse me. It is therefore welcome that at Stage 2 the Committee unanimously backed John Finney's amendment, the Taylor Test, as recommended in the Stage 1 report. And this means that Sheriff considering whether to sanction counsel for the purpose of any relevant expenses rule must employ a general test of reasonableness and have regard to the quality of arms. My amendments gently nudge the matter a little further forward. Amendments 69 to 72 in my name and supported by the Faculty of Advocates seek to improve this test by supporting the choice of litigants. They will cause sanction to be refused only if the decision of the litigant to instruct counsel was unreasonable. 
I believe this better strikes the balance between the freedom of parties to be represented by skilled advocates and control by the court over expenses. My amendments also make clear that the importance or value of the claim to the party instructing counsel will always be a relevant consideration when a sheriff is considering whether or not to grant sanction. I move amendment 69 in my name and I urge uh, the chamber to support it. Many thanks. I now call on Graham Pearson to speak to amendment 16 and other amendments in the group, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Amendment 16 seeks to enable the chamber to thoroughly debate the issues that surround uh, the uh, situation we are debating at this part of the Bill. Uh, Amendment 17, the purpose of which is to establish a presumption in favour of sanction for counsel for victims of work-related injuries and all personal injury cases where more than £20,000 is claimed or that uh, involves a death. Whilst I wel welcome John Finney's amendment at stage 2, and recognise that this improves litigants' ability to access counsel in the sheriff courts, it does not go far enough in my view. We need to ensure that victims of work-related injuries have access to counsel and benefit from their expertise, particularly to mit mitigate the effects of Section 69 Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Act 2013. I accept an intervention. John Finney. Thank you. I'm grateful for the member taking the intervention. Would the member accept that, given the complexity of the nature of these cases, they're guaranteed counsel anyway? Mr Pearson. Well, th that absence of a confidence of the guarantee is, is what I seek to deliver in terms of, of the amendment. Section 69, which was mentioned by the Cabinet Secretary eh, earlier in this debate, eh, removed the automatic assumption that a breach of health and safety law is a breach of duty of care uh, an employer owes to an employee. As a result, most workers seek con compensation for injuries suffered as a result of accidents at work in or after October 2013 and are no longer able to solely to rely on a breach of health and safety regulations to establish liability. Instead, they are only able to seek compensation where it can be shown that the employer was actually at fault or negligent. This makes it substantially more difficult for every victim of a workplace accident and injury to secure just recompense and many victims who previously would have been able to obtain compensation will have lost that right. It will increase the complexity of cases. Uh, the Scottish Parliament may not have the legislative competence to reverse Section 69 of the Enterprise Act but we can use the power that the Parliament has to mitigate the impact of Section 69 as much as is possible. This is what Scottish Labour wants to do with this amendment on sanction of Council. We therefore urge you to support our amendments rather than allowing the Bill to pass in its current form, potentially making the situation worse for victims. Many thanks. Roger Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I've got mixed feelings about uh, this uh, Alison McInnes's amendment, to which I want to speak uh, primarily about. On the one hand, I recognise the progress in having the test proposed by Sheriff Taylor on the face of the bill, and I regard that as a substantial step forward. On the other hand, I do accept the argument that, uh, um, that individuals may still be impeded in their choice of lawyer by the test as is currently drafted, and therefore I've got some sympathy with Alison McInnes's amendment. And I certainly don't accept the argument that the instruction of counsel per se necessarily involves disproportionate costs, as is suggested by some stakeholders. I think we should remember that recent changes to practice now enable counsel to appear in the Sheriff Court without solicitors, a change which was introduced shortly after Sheriff Taylor reported. And it's certainly my understanding that even in the court of session at the present time, in legally aided uh, judicial review cases, petitioners are now routinely appearing, counsels routinely appearing without a solicitor. Um, it seems, however, that on the other side of the argument that uh, uh, section 102B4 uh, provides an opportunity for the court to take into account other matters. One 
could be that it might be relevant when a sheriff is considering whether or not to grant sanction for counsel um, and, uh, and the application is being made by a solicitor to take account of the argument put forward by the solicitor that if the application is granted, he himself will not be present at the hearing. It seems to me that the bill as drafted does give the opportunity for a court to consider that as an appropriate matter when considering the whole question of sanction for counsel. I accept, however, that perhaps this is not the right time to take this debate further, but I hope the matter will remain under review by the Scottish Civil Justice Council or otherwise. Christine thank, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I think as it stands at the moment, uh, as amended at stage two, uh, where we now have, in the part for the Sanctuary of Council and the Sheriff Court and the Sheriff Appeal Court, the desirability of ensuring that no party gains an unfair advantage by virtue of the employment of counsel was a very important addition to ensure equality of arms. Where I have concerns uh, with the part, one of the parts of the amendment uh, by Alice McInnes is where she inserts, after proceedings, insert, including its importance or value to the party instructing counsel, well, everyone who goes to court thinks it's valuable to them. Of course they do, no matter what it is. So I think that that really is not an appropriate test. And as to Graham Pearson's uh, Amendment 17, I'm looking at uh, subparagraph 5, where he says relevant proceedings to include all work-related personal injury proceedings or at C, any other personal injury proceedings in which damage is claimed exclusive of interest and expenses exceeds 20,000. Now, the important word there is claimed, because, as you know from evidence, and I know from experience, that claims will be substantially higher than what can be uh, settled at the end of the day. It might even just be £5,000. So I think my issue there is that test of the claim of £20,000 is not really a practical test in law. Thank you. Margaret Mitchell. Uh, Amendments 69, 70 and 71 will create a presumption for sanction for counsel in the Sheriff Court. This will strengthen the principle of quality of arms and ensures that pursuers are not dissuaded from raising an action due to the fear of unaffordable and often disproportionate costs. I'm therefore happy to support this amendment. So whilst I'm sympathetic to the intent of Amendment 17, I once again feel that it's too prescriptive in nature and quite limited in scope. And the Alison McInnes, amend, uh, McInnes's amendment relating to sanction for counsel are preferable in this instance. Um, in particular, Amendment 72 ensures that the importance or value of any claim in proceedings to the party instructing counsel is taken into account when decisions regarding sanction for counsel are made. And this seems to me to be a fair provision, and I'm happy to support that amendment. Welcome to um, brief life strongly support uh, amendments uh, 16 and 17 uh, moved by uh, Graham Pearson. Um, John Finney intervened on him to say that um, victims of workplace accidents and diseases would be guaranteed counsel anyway. I mean, I presume he means in practice, which the minister may want to comment on, but certainly not in law. So that seems to me to be an argument in favour uh, of Graham Pearson's amendments rather than an argument against us. I'm sure most, uh, if not uh, all, members are concerned uh, about the way in which the scales of justice have been tipped against the victims of workplace accidents and disease in favour uh, of defending employers uh, or insurers by Section 69 of the Enterprise Act. And as Graham Pearson said, the least we can do in this Parliament, surely, and this must be an argument that appeals to uh, government uh, members, the least we can do is use the powers that we have uh, to uh, tip the scales uh, in the other direction and uh, lessen the impact of Section 69 of the Enterprise uh, Act. So I hope that the government will accept Graham Pearson's amendment. Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, we're, we're in a situation where, at stage two, uh, John Finney lodged an amendment which has become Section 102B. It put the test recommended by Sheriff Principal Taylor in his review of expenses and funding of civil litigation in Scotland onto the face of the bill. The committee agreed to this without division. Yet here we are considering two sets of amendments, the first of which sets the presumption for counsel on its head and the second of which replaces it. Alison McInnes's proposed amendments to 102B subsection 2 totally distort the test recommended by Sheriff Principal Taylor from one where a sanction must be granted if the court considers it reasonable to do so, 
to one where sanction must always be granted unless it is unreasonable. Also, I believe that Amendment 72 introduces a subjective element to the test which was not there before. The value of the test is that the court has to assess the case objectively, not from the point of view of one of the parties. These would make it very difficult to dislodge a presumption in favour of counsel in all, and I emphasise all, cases. And I consider this goes too far. I continue to believe that the test as set out in section 102B will ensure that those who require access to counsel will be able to receive it and that the best person to decide if sanction is appropriate is the sheriff. We have also ensured that this test can be easily and quickly amended if it is felt that the system is restricting access to justice by allowing changes through an act of sederent. Reducing the cost of litigation to parties is one of the main aims of the reforms, and I do not believe the amendments as proposed will meet this aim. Graham Pearson's Amendment 17 is the same as one lodged by John Pentland at Stage 2. That amendment was not agreed to. Further, Graham Pearson's Amendment 16 removes Section 102B from the Bill despite unanimous agreement to it by the Justice Committee. Amendment 17 would establish in primary legislation a presumption in favour of sanction for counsel in specified types of personal injury cases in an all-Scotland specialist court. One such type set out in the amendment is work-related personal injury proceedings, and I'm concerned that this could place this part of the bill out with legislative competence given the reservation upon health and safety in the workplace. The amendment would provide that the presumption in favour of sanction for counsel could only be rebutted where special cause is shown that the case is straightforward, involves settled law, or involves a small number of witnesses whose evidence is not expected to be complex. This is a very high test. The Scottish ministers are to be given a power by order to vary the list of relevant proceedings to which sanction will automatically be given. Amendment 18, which is also the same as one lodged by John Pentland at Stage 2, makes this order subject to affirmative procedure. The rules are otherwise inflexible, and this is precisely the kind of rule which the Scottish Government considers should not be placed in primary legislation. I would ask the members to respect the decision of the Justice Committee and withdraw their amendments. I now call on Alice McInnes to wind up, and if you could indicate whether you wish to press or withdraw. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The Minister has made much of the fact that the Committee unanimously accepted uh, the amendment at Stage 2. Well, indeed we did, because it was a, bit a step forward and it was an improvement to there being nothing there at all. Um, I believe my amendments are reasonable and they better strike the balance between the freedom to choose to be represented by skilled advocates and control by the court over the expenses. Without these amendments, individuals will still be constrained in their ability to instruct counsel. And we do need to try and strike a fairer balance. Roderick Campbell himself acknowledged that this will not necessarily be costly. Uh, in terms of responding to Christine Graham's point, um, it's important uh, to acknowledge that my amendment uh, recognises that more than the monetary value should be taken into consideration and that the importance of the claim to the party themselves does need to be considered. And I will press, sorry, I will press my amendment. Thank you. Um, the question then is that amendment number 69 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Uh, the Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. This will be a one minute division. Members should cast the votes now.
The result of the vote on amendment number 69 is as follows. Yes, 15. No, 64. There were 31 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call amendment number 70 in the name of Alice McInnes, which has already been debated with amendment number 69. Alice McInnes to move or not move? Move. The question is that amendment number 70 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cancel votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 70 is as follows. Yes, 15. No, 64. There were 31 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call amendment number 71 in the name of Alice McInnes, which has already been debated with amendment number 69. Alice McInnes to move or not move? Move. The question is, amendment number 71 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cancel votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 71 is as follows. Yes, 13. No, 64. There were 31 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call amendment number 72 in the name of Alice McInnes, which has already been debated with amendment number 6, which has already been debated with amendment number 69. I call Alison McInnes to move or not move amendment number 72. Moved. The question is that amendment number 72 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cancel votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 72 is as follows. Yes, 14. No, 64. There were 31 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call amendment number 36 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, which has already been debated with amendment number 19. Minister, to move formally. Minister, to move formally. Okay. The question is, amendment number 36 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I now call amendment number 16 in the name of Graham Pearson, which has already been debated with amendment number 69. Graham Pearson to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. I now call amendment number 17 in the name of Graham Pearson, which has already been debated with amendment number 69. Graham Pearson to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that amendment number 17 in the name of Graham Pearson be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Are we all agreed? No, the Parliament has not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast the votes now.
The result of the vote on amendment number 17 is as follows. Yes, 31. No, 80. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call amendment number 7 in the name of Elaine Murray, which has already been debated with amendment number 61, and I call Elaine Murray to move or not move. Moved, presiding officer. The question is, amendment number 7 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? No. Parliament has not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast the votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 7 is as follows. Yes, 46. No, 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call amendment number 8 in the name of Elaine Murray, which has already been debated with amendment number 61. Elaine Murray to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment number 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cancel votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 8 is as follows. Yes, 46. No, 64. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I call amendment number 9 in the name of Elaine Murray, which has already been debated with amendment number 61. Elaine Murray to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. I now call amendment number 37 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 19. Minister, to move formally? Moved. The question is, Amendment number 37 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is agreed. I now call Group 11, which is the appointment of judges, etc. I call Amendment number 38 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendments number 53, 54 and 57. Minister to move amendment number 38 and to speak to all the amendments in the group. Amendment 38 substitutes sections 21 to 23 of the Judiciary and Court Scotland Act 2008 with new sections 20A to 20G. The new sections make provision for the appointment of judges, temporary judges and re-employed retired judges of the Court of Session and make provision for the remuneration and expenses of temporary and former judges. Amendments 53 and 54 are consequential amendments required owing to Amendment 38. Effectively, this repeals and re-enacts, without significant policy modification, the current law relating to the appointment of judges, temporary judges and re-employed uh, re retired judges of the Court of Session, modernising the law and placing the provisions in a more accessible part of the statute book. Uh, they're currently uh, uh, referred to in the Law Reform Miscellaneous Provisions Scotland Act 1985 and 1990. Amendment 57 is a purely technical amendment that amends the long title of the bill to reflect the new provision about the appointment of the judiciary added by Amendment 38. And I move Amendment 38. Lee Murray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And yet again, I query why these amendments were laid two days before the deadline for amendments. And in this case, it's not just a, a moan. It's because there is something in there which, had it been there at stage one, we might, it might have wanted to consider amendment to. And that is uh, on, in uh, Amendment 38, which amends 20A uh, of the Judiciary and Court Scotland Act 2008, uh, Part 1A2, states that the person has to have held office as either sheriff principal or sheriff throughout the period of five years immediately preceding the appointment. And I question whether, in fact, that is discriminatory in that it would exclude uh, 
women, for example, or even fathers who had been in paternity leave, but women who maybe had had a period of maternity leave within that five years, or indeed had been uh, absent from work for caring responsibilities. Uh, and I am therefore disappointed that we are only con considering this at stage three, when the issues around whether or not this clause is discriminatory cannot be properly uh, ex explored. Uh, and I would certainly seek uh, the Minister's uh, advice on this issue, because I think it is an important point of principle. Minister, to wind up. Uh, uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, uh, you know, I, I regret to say we are who we are. Um, this was uh, uh, viewed purely as a tidying up amendment in order to simply uh, repackage what is currently in two separate Law Reform Miscellaneous Provisions Act, uh, precisely the kind of legislation we wanted to get away from uh, when uh, the Scottish Parliament was set up. Uh, and uh, uh, there's really very little extra to add to that. Thank you. Um, the question then is that amendment number 38 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I now call amendment number 39 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with amendment number 35. Minister, to move. Thank you. The question is that amendment number 39 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. We call amendment number 18 in the name of Graham Pearson, which has already been debated with amendment number 69. Graham Pearson to move or not move? Mr Pearson's not here. Um, not, it's not moved. I now move to group number 12, which is exclusive competence and simple procedure commencement. I call amendments number 10 in the name of Elaine Murray, grouped with amendments 11 and 13. Elaine Murray to move amendment number 10 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, I ri rise to speak to amendments 10 and 11 and 13, and I will move amendment 10 in advance, as I'm likely to forget it uh, at the end. Uh, similar amendments were defeated by five votes to four at stage two, uh, but to cite the case for the introduction of a sunrise clause... Can we just settle down a wee bit, please, Ms Murray? On you go. Uh, but, but despite the fact that the, I believe that the case for the introduction of a sunrise clause remains pertinent, despite the government's arguments that such provisions are very unusual. And that is because there was an unusual degree of concern about the financial memorandum to this bill, with the three opposition parties taking the unusual course of voting against the financial memorandum. During the stage one debate, Malcolm Chisholm explained the concerns heard by the Financial Committee when considering the financial memorandum, the uncertainty uh, regarding the loss of fee income to the Scottish courts due to the transfer of cases from the Court of Session to the Sheriff Court, the implications of increased workload on the already overburdened Sheriff Courts, and the suggested savings to the legal aid budget, which were not explained satisfactorily. Uh, and it was stated that the government had relied heavily on figures from third parties, which when it came to dis uh, debate with the Finance Committee, officials were unable to substantiate. Now, the Cabinet Secretary's letter to the Convener of the Justice Committee of 23rd of September revises the financial memorandum in the light of the reduction of the exclusive competence of the Sheriff Court to £100,000. Uh, and the, legal aid, the Scottish Legal Aid Board seems to have undertaken a more rigorous modelling of its savings. Uh, and oddly, despite having initially estimated a saving of 1.2 million through the transfer of an estimated 80% of cases from the Court of Session to the Sheriff Court, it has now decreased that saving to between 550,000 and 750,000, with only a 70% transfer. So it seems to me rather strange that a reduction of 10% of cases should reduce the estimated savings by at least uh, 38%. And that does suggest to me that some of the calculations around the financial memorandum remain somewhat dubious. The dubiety regarding the level of savings in the bill will achieve uh, is also matched by concerns over the workload of the Sheriff Courts as the court closure programme takes effect. And only this weekend there was a report in my local uh, press stating that the Dumfries Sheriff Court now only achieves a 64% of its cases being resolved within 26 weeks when the Scottish Government's own target is that 100% of cases should be achieved within that period. And I, do, I, I believe there will also be similar problems have been reported at Hamilton Sheriff Court uh, after the uh, closure of the Motherwell uh, Sheriff Court. <laughs> Uh, the, the possibility that funding shortfalls might be considered by increasing court fees was flagged up as a concern in the Justice Committee Stage 1 report. And I think all of these support the arguments for a sunrise clause. The bill, this bill will only work if it is adequately resourced. And the provisions for exclusive competence and simple procedure should only be introduced 
when sufficient provision has been made for, for uh, the staffing, the resources, technology, courtroom space and judicial appointments. And, and other members have touched on this in the course of uh, the amendments today. I know that the government will uh, argue otherwise, uh, but I believe that it is important. This is, it is in nobody's interest uh, for these cases, these clauses to be introduced uh, in advance of resources being in, in place. But uh, I do not think we should take it on... Uh, on uh, reassurance that somehow everything will be all out in the night when, when, when they come in. I think that these issues are of such importance to Parliament that we should be satisfied that these sections can be successfully introduced. This is not a case for re-debating the whole of this bill, but we must be sure that when we bring in such important and such radical changes to the uh, civil justice system in Scotland, that these can be introduced without detriment to court users. Welcome to some Elaine Murray's um, sunrise, uh, proposal for a sunrise clause. I was a member of the Finance Committee, and members may remember that the Finance Memorandum was actually voted against uh, by many people uh, in this Parliament, which, of course, is, is a very uh, fairly unusual uh, procedure. As Elaine Murray said, these proposals have to be adequately resourced and the technology uh, available. And on the subject of the technology, perhaps the Minister or the Cabinet Secretary could comment on the uh, IT uh, for the Specialist Court. We're told... Uh, only 10,000 had been set aside for it, which was one concern. We're now told that the new system won't be in place until the autumn of 2016, which is obviously a, a matter uh, of concern. Um, the, revised, uh, the letter which revised some of the costings which the Cabinet Secretary sent to the Finance Committee and to Christine Graham did not substantially change uh, the points, uh, the, 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 did not su substantially alter the concerns that I and others expressed at stage one. The issue of the loss of fee income was not really addressed. The increase in the share of court workload uh, was not uh, addressed. And the change in the legal aid costings was perhaps uh, an admission that uh, the estimates previously had been uh, over generous, but it's still a bit of a mystery where even uh, three quarters of a million pounds of legal aid savings are going to come from, uh, given that the board already supports the most complex and difficult cases, that the savings are going to ha come from not having counsel, and yet we're assured that these complex cases will still uh, have counsel. And thirdly, of course, because most of the costs are recovered in any case. So there is still a great deal of mystery and a lot of questions about the finances uh, of this bill, uh, and I think uh, the proposal from Elaine Murray for a sunrise clause is the correct uh, response to those problems. Minister. Uh, amendments 10 and 11 in the name of Elaine Murray would make the commencement of sections 39 and 70 subject to affirmative procedure in the Parliament, uh, and this would be a very unusual provision indeed. Amendment 13 would place another set of procedural hurdles in the way of the commencement of sections 39 and 70 relating to the exclusive competence and simple procedure by requiring the Parliament to have approved a draft of an order under section 411 setting up an All Scotland share of court and to have considered a report on the resourcing of the court system in general, including the prospective resourcing of the specialist court before orders bringing these sections into force could be laid. Elaine Murray lodged the same amendments at stage two. Uh, the equivalent of amendment 10 was not agreed to and the other two were not moved at that time. I appreciate that the reasoning behind these amendments is to give Parliament an opportunity to consider whether the time is right to introduce the changes envisaged in sections 30, uh, 39 and 70. But the committee has already asked those questions and the Lord President, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Court Service and Sheriff Principal Stephen have all given evidence to the effect that plans have been made and resources have been allocated. It would be in no one's interest to commence the provisions of sections 39 or 70 before the time was right. The argument for reform uh, have, has been made eloquently in the Scottish Civil Courts Review and the matter has been extensively debated before the committee. In relation to the report required by Amendment 13, I would remind the committee that under the Judiciary and Courts Scotland Act 2008, which was passed unanimously by this parliament, the Scottish Courts Service is now an independent, judicially-led corporate body which runs the Scottish Courts. Under Section 2, Subsection 2 of the Act, it is the Lord President who is responsible for making and maintaining arrangements for securing the efficient disposal of business in the Scottish Courts. If a report on staffing, resources, IT, court capacity and judicial capacity were to be desired, it would therefore be for the Lord President to provide it. 
But in fact, no such report is required, as this committee has already heard evidence, as I've already alluded to, that resources have been allocated and the reforms will permit the courts to work more efficiently. The Chief Executive of the Scottish Court Service highlighted that in fact Sheriff Courts face less pressure today than two years ago due to a general downward trend in demand for civil court services. Sheriff Principal Stephen told the committee that the proposed reforms would allow the courts to work more efficiently, thus freeing up current resources. She also highlighted that if the bill is passed, cases will start in the Sheriff Court and there will be a gradual build-up of the volume, adding that there will not be a tsunami of work descending on the Sheriff Court. This point does bear repeating. Many have spoken of a transfer of business from the Court of Session. I have used that shorthand myself, but the bill will not transfer existing cases from the Court of Session to the Sheriff Court. All it does is provide for the future, and the build-up of work in the Sheriff Court will be a gradual one, taking place over time as new cases are raised. There is therefore simply no need for a report to be done before commencement, and I would ask the Member to withdraw her amendments. Lee Murray to wind up and to indicate whether you wish to press or withdraw the amendment. Yes. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, certainly, uh, I'm not going to argue against the reforms which this legislation uh, it, and it is, is going to bring in. Uh, and I think there is agreement that they are all necessary. But I think the important thing is that the reform goes along with resources and that the resources have to be there. Uh, yet again, we've said it's unusual, but we, the unusual nature of the circumstances where. where large numbers of members of this chamber have had serious, sufficiently serious concerns to vote against a financial memorandum, which is a most unusual step to be taken in this parliament, actually shows the necessity for us to take on the responsibilities. We are responsible as a parliament to ensure that the legislation that we pass uh, is actually properly resourced. And this is a particularly important piece of reform of the Scottish civil justice system. Surely we have a responsibility to ensure when we bring this in that it will work and it will not overburden our court system to the detriment of court uh, users. Can I also remind Parliament that we don't see the level four budgets for organisations such as the court service. We're not able to derogate those budgets when it comes to the budget process in the way we would the directors of, uh, of the Scottish Government. And we have less opportunity to ensure uh, that the money is, is, is following the requirements and following the need for resources. And can I just finally add, say to Parliament, please, let the, the implementation of this legislation not just be an operational matter for the Scottish Court Service, because that is far too often the operational matter for somebody else. Let's take responsibility as a parliament. Are you pressing the amendment, Ms Murray? I take it you're pressing the I amendment. Press amendment yes. Thank you. Um, the question then is that amendment number 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 10 is as follows, yes, 46, no, 65. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call amendment number 11 in the name of Elaine Murray. It has already been debated with amendment number 10. Elaine Murray to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is, amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast the votes now.
The result of the vote on amendment number 11 is as follows. Yes, 46. No, 64. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call amendment number 40 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with amendment number 20. Minister, to move formally. The question is that amendment number 40 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is agreed. I now move to group number 13, which is report on operation of court functions, and I call amendment number 11 in the name of Elaine Murray, which is in a group of its own. Elaine Murray to move and speak to amendment number 12. Okay. Thank you, uh, presiding officer. Uh, amendment 12 is concerned with a report to Parliament on the operation of court functions. Uh, at stage two, I suggested that the Scottish Government should report annually to Parliament on the way in which this bill is working in practice. I have altered this requirement in this amendment, uh, requiring a biannual, biannual rather than annual reporting. I think uh, that would obviously be less onerous for the Scottish Government, uh, and it would mean that only so these, such a report would only have to be laid uh, twice a year. Uh, at stage two, uh, sorry, twice within a parliamentary term. Ms Gunningham uh, argued that as the Scottish Court Service produced an annual report to Scottish Ministers, which is laid before Parliament, that my amendment would duplicate this requirement of the Judici Judiciary and Courts Scotland Act of 2008, uh, and I withdrew my amendment at stage two in order to consider this argument. However, I have brought this less onerous requirement back, a requirement back at stage three, because actually, on reflection, I do not consider that it would duplicate the Scottish Court Service report, uh, as I am requesting specific information about the operation of this particular Act and not about the operation of the Scottish Court Service generally. The amendment requires ministers, not the Scottish Court, Court Service or the Lord President, to report on the numbers and types of cases and, importantly, on the average length of time taking to dispose of each kind of case. And I refer you back to what I said in, in support of my previous amendments. When we are seeing such issues as in Dumfries, the Dumfries Sheriff Court only being able to manage to get two-thirds of its cases through in the, re the required amount of time, there is something that we need to take note of here, and Parliament needs to take this seriously. So it's important that we have such things as the average length of time taken to dispose of cases actually reported to Parliament, along with the provision made for the required resources uh, to cater for the demand for court services. And again, I refer to the fact that we do not see Level 4 data uh, on the Scottish Court services. This would allow parliamentary scrutiny of the legislation as passed. It would provide transparency and, again, it would require ministerial responsibility rather than the implementation of this legislation becoming an operational matter for the Scottish Court Service or the Lord President. Thank you. In the interest of clarity, can I just say that was amendment number 12 that has been moved by Aline Murray. I now call Margaret Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. This amendment will help to facilitate post-legislative scrutiny as we move to the implementation, implementation stage of this bill, requiring a report to be reduce, produced every two years on the time taken to dispose of cases and resourcing issues will further enhance accountability to the Parliament. And I think this is particularly important in view of the, the delays currently being experienced to um, court cases being heard within the 26-week time target. I therefore support the amendment. Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It is the Government's position that the intent of this amendment continues to be unnecessary. The Lord President and the Chief Executive of the Scottish Court Service emphasised in their evidence to the Committee that the Sheriff Court will be able to cope, and as the reforms will take pressure off the Court of Session, uh, there should not be any problems there either. Section 67 of the Judiciary and Court Scotland Act 2008 does indeed require that as soon as practicable after the end of each and every financial year, the Scottish Court Service must prepare and publish a report on the carrying out of its functions during that year, which is sent to the Scottish Ministers with a copy of the report to be laid before the Scottish Parliament. The 2008 Act, I need to remind everybody in this chamber, was unanimously passed by this Parliament and it rightly places on the Scottish Court Service the responsibility of preparing an annual report and not on the Scottish Ministers. And I ask uh, for these reasons that Elaine Murray withdraw her amendment. Elaine Murray to wind up and indicate where you wish to place or withdraw. Yes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I know that the Minister yet again says that this amendment is unnecessary, but 
I think we are talking about two different types of report because I do not think that the Scottish Court Service report which will contain information on the operation of this Act. It will not enable post-legislative scrutiny of this particular Act. It will contain information on the functionings of the Scottish Court Service, but that's not what this amendment is asking for. It's asking for information as to how this Act is operating, once it is functioning, whether the necessary resources are there to make sure that it is functioning properly. Uh, and uh, it is, I do not think, a huge burden to place on ministers to require them to do this twice within the, the, the course of one parliament. It is important when we reform our judicial system that we, uh, we know that the, the reforms that we're bringing in are working properly. There's no point in bringing in further report reforms if we find out the reforms that we, we've brought in are being held up through lack of resources and so on. I still think it is important uh, that uh, Parliament has given this information. I will therefore be pressing my amendment. Thank you. The question is, amendment number 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast the votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12 is as follows. Yes, 47. No, 64. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call amendment number 13 in the name of Elaine Murray. It's already been debated with amendment number 10. Elaine Murray to move or not move? Moved. The question then is that amendment number 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament has not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 13 is as follows, yes, 45, no, 65, there were no abstentions, the amendment is therefore not agreed to. We now move to group number 14, summary share of civil competence. I call amendment number 3 in the name of Alice McInnes, grouped with amendment 4. Alice McInnes to move amendment 3 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Amendments 3 and 4 are supported by the Law Society of Scotland. They propose removing adoption and forced marriage proceedings from the list of civil proceedings in which a summary sheriff has competence as set out in Schedule 1. This is due to their distinct complexity. Last week, in fact, it became a criminal offence to force someone into marriage, punishable by up to seven years in prison. Given this new criminal liability, the continuing civil remedies for those at risk of forced marriage and those who have already entered into a forced marriage, forced marriage protection orders, will become even more multifaceted and sensitive. We know that these cases can also be further complicated by challenging international, cultural and ethical dimensions. Similarly, the Law Society of Scotland says adoption and the grant of authority to adopt are the most serious form of interference in family life and as such should not be the responsibility of the most junior tier of the judiciary. The society tells us these are among the most demanding cases heard in the Sheriff Court. In establishing the facts, sheriffs consider, regularly consider a wealth of reports and records and hear from a number of witnesses and it can be a difficult balancing act to satisfy the requirements of domestic and international law such as the European Convention on Human Rights. 
Indeed, during stage two, the Cabinet Secretary told the committee, and I quote, the rationale for the introduction of summary sheriffs is that they should undertake work in the sheriff court to relieve sheriffs of the burden of dealing with the more legally straightforward civil cases and to thus permit sheriffs to be available for the more complex casework. He made my case for me. Both forced marriage and adoption cases require a greater level of shrieval competence than others listed in Schedule 1, such as the consideration of warrants and interim orders and the extension of time to pay debts. Sheriffs and specialist family sheriffs are best placed to respond to the complexity of these cases and take into account their far-reaching consequences. And I move Amendment 3 in my name. Margaret Mitch. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I stated at stage two, Alison McInnes makes a compelling case. These cases are very complex and emotive, and it makes sense to move them from the competence of the summary sheriff's jurisdiction. Uh, and I too am very mindful of the Cabinet Secretary's um, statement at stage two on the 10th of June, which Alison McInnes had just um, quoted. Therefore, it seems to me entirely logical that these complex cases are removed from the of the sheriff, summary sheriffs. Minister. Uh, Presiding officer, amendments three and four in the name of Alison McInnes would remove adoption proceedings and force marriage protection orders from the competence of summary sheriffs. The summary sheriffs will be highly qualified. They will have at least 10 years legal experience, the same as sheriffs. All judicial officers at whichever level of the court system will be recommended for appointment by the Judicial Appointments Board for Scotland and trained as required by the Judicial Institute for Scotland. Assignment of cases in order to ensure the efficient disposal of the business is for the local sheriff principal. If a case is particularly complex, the sheriff principal may assign it to a sheriff as opposed to a summary sheriff, and where family specialists are appointed in a sheriffdom, sheriff's principal should have regard to ensuring that such cases are dealt with by those specialists. Giving evidence at the Justice Committee on 18th March, the Sheriff's Association said that they welcomed the jurisdiction of the summary sheriff and that the summary sheriffs will be perfectly competent and comfortable doing family cases. Drawing summary sheriffs from areas of specialist expertise and bringing practical experience is seen as a good opportunity by some solicitors, including experienced family practitioners. The Family Law Association told the committee, it does not really matter whether they are summary sheriffs or sheriffs, as long as they are experienced and have knowledge of family cases. That is the most important thing. Amendments 3 and 4 don't, in fact, divide cases up along lines of importance. They would, for example, leave domestic abuse proceedings and children's hearings within the competence of the summary sheriff, neither of which I would respectfully suggest are less important than adoption or forced marriage. The government believes that these amendments would lead to incoherence in the summary sheriff's jurisdiction, and for these reasons, I oppose Alison McInnes' amendments. Alison McInnes, to wind up, and if you could indicate whether you wish to press or withdraw. Thank you. I'll just briefly say that it's not about whether or not um, other cases are less important, but that it's the complexity of the issues um, around about these two particular issues, and I will press my amendment. Thank you. The question then is that amendment number three be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number three is as follows. Yes, 44. No, 65. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call amendment number four in the name of Alice McInnes, which has already been debated with amendment number three. Alice McInnes, to move or not move? Moved. 
The question then is that amendment number four be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number four is as follows. Yes, 45. No, 65. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call amendment number 41 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, which has already been debated with amendment number 19. Minister, to be formally thank you. The question is, amendment number 41 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament has agreed. We now move to group number 15. Um, Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, Tax Tribunals. I call amendment number 42 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with amendments number 43 and 44. Minister to move amendment number 42 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Amendments 42 to 44 are technical in nature and provide for transitional arrangements relating to the merging of the Scottish Tribunal Service into the Scottish Court Service to form the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. Amendment 42 adds both of the tax tribunals, the first tier tax tribunal for Scotland and the upper tax tribunal for Scotland, to the list of tribunals which are to receive administrative support from the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service in advance of being transferred into the Scottish Tribunals. Paragraph 3, subsection 3 uh, and 4 of Schedule 3 to the Courts Reform Bill also makes transitional provision which allows for presidents of various existing tribunals to be appointed as judicial members of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service under paragraph 2, subsection 2G of Schedule 3 to the Judiciary and Courts Scotland Act 2008, inserted by paragraph 1, subsection 8C of Schedule 3 to the Bill, in place of a Chamber President. Amendment 43 provides that the President of the Scottish Tax Tribunals is eligible to be appointed to this position. Lastly, I come to Amendment 44. Section 58 of the Revenue Scotland and Taxpayers Act 2014 is intended to allow Scottish Government officials acting under the badge of the Scottish Tribunal Service to provide administrative support to the Scottish Tax Tribunals in their initial guise as freestanding tribunals. It is similar to Section 77 of the Tribunal Scotland Act 2014, which is proposed to be repealed by Paragraph 8 of Part 3 of Schedule 3 to the Courts Reform Bill. I consider that Section 58 of the RSTPB ought to be equivalently repealed within Part 3 of Schedule 3 to the Bill, and Amendment 44 provides for this. I am sure, uh, Presiding Officer, everybody has followed that with interest, and I move Amendment 42. Thank you. Uh, no member has asked to speak in this, Strange so week. does the Minister wish to wind up? Uh, no. I didn't think so. The question is that Amendment number 42 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament has agreed. I now call amendments number 43 to 54, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move amendments number 43 to... Moved on block. Sorry. You're, you're a you're ahead of me. <laughs> I invite the Minister to move amendments 43 to 54 on block. Moved on block. Does any member object a single question be put on these amendments? No. In that case, then... Um, the question is, amendments number 43 to 54 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And we now move to the final group, which is group number 16, citation of jurors. I call amendment number 55 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and a group of its own. Minister, to speak to and move amendment number 55. Uh, Presiding officer, this amendment will remove the current restriction on how the Scottish Court Service cites persons for juries in order to permit a choice of methods. In England and Wales, for example, citation is by means of first-class post rather than recorded delivery. 
This was part of a package of efficiency measures in the Criminal Justice Scotland Bill. And the reason for bringing forward this amendment at stage three of the Courts Reform Bill is simple. It will save the Scottish Court Service up to around £169,000 per annum. At a time when budgets and public organisations are in indeed under pressure, it does seem wholly appropriate to ensure that this cost-saving measure can be implemented as soon as possible. The savings are as a result of the Scottish Court Service being able to choose first-class post or perhaps even electronic citation rather than being compelled to use recorded delivery. I move Amendment 55. Thank you. I call McInnes. Thank you. I understand what the Minister is saying. I just um, seek some assurances from her that there are safeguards there to appeal um, if there's a non-delivery of, of such an item, because failing to turn up if cited can lead to a fine of up to £1,000. So what kind of appeal process is there to, to cover that? Minister? Yeah, I, I would advise the member that, uh, my understanding, this will be have, to have to be dealt with by an SSI, and I think all of those issues would be discussed at that particular point. Thank you. So, question is that Amendment 55 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you. Call Amendments 56, 57, 58 and 59, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated, and I invite the Minister to move these amendments on block. Moved on block. Does any member object to a single question being put on these amendments? And as it appears no member does, the question is that amendments 56 to 59 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Excellent. That ends consideration of amendments. And we will now move to the debate. I will allow a few minutes before we begin the debate. The next item of business is debate on motion number 11101 in the name of Kenny McCaskill on the Courts Reform Scotland Bill. I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary Kenny McCaskill to speak to and move the motion. Mr McCaskill, you have ten minutes or thereby, please. <coughs> uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I am delighted to open the debate today on the Courts Reform Scotland Bill. This bill takes on the majority of Lord Gill's recommendations from the Scottish Civil Courts Review. And I wish to thank all those organisations and individuals who responded to the consultation and who gave evidence to the committee, as well as our justice partners. And I'd especially like to thank the members and the clerks of the Justice Committee for their work over the past year. The bill delivers on many of the Scottish Civil Court Review recommendations to improve what Lord Gill described as the, and I quote, slow, inefficient and expensive Scottish civil justice system. Lord Gill emphasised at stage one that these reforms are, and I quote, 50 years overdue. The main principles of the bill are that the right cases should be heard in the right courts at the right costs. Unnecessary delays to users should be minimised. The efficiencies of the courts should be increased. The bill will set a new exclusive competence for the Sheriff Court in order to remove a proportion of cases from the Court of Session so that it can focus on Scotland's most challenging and complex civil cases and develop the law. A new National Specialist Personal Injury court, Sheriff Court will be created, maintaining a centre of expertise where personal injury cases from throughout the country can be heard. Other key planks of the reforms include further specialisation at the Shrieval level, a new Sheriff Appeal Court and a new judicial tier in the Sheriff Court, the Summary Sheriffs, who will use a new simple procedure, facilitating easier access to justice. A number of important improvements were made to the Bill at Stage 2, many of which responded to suggestions raised during the Justice Committee's Stage 1 scrutiny of it. And in response to an amendment proposed by Sandra White, we agreed to reduce the exclusive competence from the proposed 150,000 to 100,000. Many stakeholders who appeared in front of the Justice Committee believed that the 150,000 figure proposed by Lord Gill was too high, and the committee agreed with this. A figure of 100,000 was agreed to help meet those concerns while still being able to underpin the reforms in terms of delivering the more efficient and affordable system 
envisaged by Lord Gill. The Law Society has called this figure a, and I quote, significant improvement. The committee also heard concerns from some witnesses, including the STUC, that litigants whose cases will now be raised in the new personal injury court rather than the court of session will no longer have to use counsel and will instead have to apply to the sheriff to grant expenses for the use of counsel if they wish. Trade unions have always seen the litigation process as important to improving workplace safety and have engaged fully and constructively throughout the court reform debate going all the way back to Lord Gill's original review. They have shown willingness to support change but have also expressed legitimate concerns to which we in the Scottish Government have listened. The trade unions are also very worried about Section 69 of the Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Act. They see the dangers in a system where the cost recovery regime perhaps unintentionally stacks the deck in favour of those with the deepest pockets. If the Scottish Government had the power, we would reverse Section 69 tomorrow. We lost that opportunity in the referendum, but perhaps powers over health and safety will be given to this Parliament as part of the promised package of new powers. If it does, we will act. In the meantime, we will use the powers we do have to ameliorate the worst consequences of Section 69. We therefore supported John Finney's amendments at Stage 2, which will allow, where appropriate, health and safety cases of any financial value to be heard by the Specialist Personal Injury Court and to put the recommendation of Sheriff Principal Taylor on sanction for counsel on a statutory footing. We believe that this test will ensure those who require counsel will have access to it, whilst leaving the decision whether this is applicable to the person best placed to decide, uh, the sheriff. It will be for each sheriff to determine if one or more aspect of the tailored test for sanction is met. But it would seem to me to be quite self-evident that for at least the next few years, until the courts have had the chance to properly set the parameters of the law in light of Section 69, that this test for sanction is likely to be met in the majority of work-related personal injury cases. Included in the test, sheriffs will have to have regard to the equality of representation of the parties. This will ensure that counsel is available to parties when appropriate. Scotland is also rightly proud of the considerable skills and expertise of its independent referral bar. <clears throat> and I agree with the learned Dean that the bar exists to represent those who need skilled representation wherever and whenever they need it. I do not see this in any way diminished by the measures in the Bill. I agree with the Lord President, who said, and I quote, that the opportunity should still exist for the specialist bar to work in the Sheriff Courts, because some significant litigation will be taking place there. And he continued, and I continue quotes, it would be helpful and in everyone's interests if members of the faculty were given proper opportunities to appear in significant sheriff court actions, I would greatly regret it if they didn't." End quotes. He's also said that, in my opinion, owing to the excellence of the independent bar, the Faculty of Advocates will survive these reforms and continue to coexist with solicitor colleagues, <clears throat> each complementing the other's services and skills and maintaining a high standard of advocacy in all of the courts. The provisions in this bill will ensure that litigants can still access representation by counsel when they need it. However, sanction for counsel is not the only factor in the important issue of equality of arms. Another issue is the procedures used in low-value personal injury cases. And I've said in the past and repeat today that a small claims type procedure with very limited cost recovery is no place for personal injury cases. There must be fair cost recovery in personal injury cases of any value, and I do not see how this could be achieved by a fixed cost regime. That is why I agreed with the Lord President when he recommended a separate table of fees for personal injury cases raised under simple procedure, and this, along with other issues relating to the costs and funding of litigation, will be taken forward by the Scottish Civil Justice Council 
in responding to the recommendations made by Sheriff Principal Taylor on this issue. And in response to concerns that the tests for transfer of complex cases to the higher courts was too strict, we brought forward further amendments at stage two to ensure that this was not the case. And this will ensure that those complex and challenging cases that require the attention of Scotland's top civil court are able to be heard there irrespective of the value. As we have already discussed in relation to amendments tabled by Lane Murray and Graham Pearson on ensuring that provision has been made for staffing and resources in terms of the new courts established by these bills, these matters are fully catered for. Lord Gill, Sheriff Principal Stephen and Mr McQueen all emphasised in their evidence to the committee that the Sheriff Court system will be able to cope. And with the Lord President stating, and I quote, I am absolutely certain that the capacity exists in the Sheriff Courts to absorb all of the business, end quotes. We will not see a deluge of cases descending in the Sheriff Courts. This is simply not the case, as Sheriff Principal Stephen pointed out at committee. The exclusive competence will not be raised until the personal injury court is ready to receive cases, as the Chief Executive of the Court Service, Eric McQueen, told the committee. There will not be a sudden transfer of the existing cases from the Court of Session into the personal injury court, but rather a gradual building of cases. Existing personal injury cases in the Court of Session will see out their life there. Those raising new personal injury cases will be able to raise them in the most appropriate court, whether that is the personal injury court or the local sheriff court, or for those over 100,000, the Court of Session. At an exclusive competence of 100,000, we would only expect a 3% rise in civil cases raised in the local sheriff courts, with the majority of those raised in the new personal injury court. And the Scottish Court Service is compelled under the Judiciary and Court Scotland Act 2008 to prepare and publish a report on the carrying out of its functions during each year, which is sent to the Scottish Ministers and laid before uh, Parliament. Deputy Presiding Officer, the passage of this bill is an important milestone in the Court's reform journey. This is a journey that we will take together with our justice partners to ensure that our court system is now fit for purpose for the 21st century. And I look forward to hearing members' views on the bill. But I move that the Parliament agrees that the Courts Reform Scotland Bill be passed. Many thanks. And I now call on Dr Elaine Murray, seven minutes earlier by, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Radio Scotland this morning described this as an important reform of the civil justice system, and indeed it is. It's had a long gestation period. Uh, it was, in fact, my good friend Cathy Jemison, who in 2007, uh, as Justice Minister at the time, invited Lord Gill to conduct a review of the civil courts following the publication of a document on civil courts reform by the Civil Justice Ad Ad Advisory Committee. And she asked Lord Gill to review both the, the provision of civil justice by the courts and to have regard to the cost of litigation, the role of mediation and dispute resolution, the development of modern methods of communication and case management, the specialisation of courts and procedures and the relationship between the civil and criminal courts. Lord Gill's final report was presented in 2000, uh, October 2009 uh, and now five years later we are at the final stage of the passage of the Court Reform Scotland Bill. And there is no disagreement on these benches that the civil court system required reform and modernisation or indeed that the cost of litigation is an important issue for the parties concerned and of course for the public purse. And we welcome that uh, we will now see the introduction of, of simple procedure, which we understand will be less confrontation, or conf confrontational, which will involve negotiation and mediation and dispute resolution. And we welcome that. We also welcome the appointment of, of specialist sheriffs and the, the formation of the specialist personal injury court, although we did have some, some uh, uh, reservations about the level of exclusive competence. What really has concerned us is that these reforms should not be motivated by cost cutting to the extent that they would be at the detriment of the court user. In particular, where individuals are taking on wealthy and powerful organisations, such as in the case of personal injury claims, claims, we wanted to ensure that the legal representation provided to the claimant can match that which can be bought by the, by the defendant. We were also concerned that these measures should not place additional pressures on the sheriff courts, which we are told, and all of us, I'm sure, are told, are already overburdened. 
We have therefore welcomed a number of amendments to the Bill at Stage 2. For example, John Finney's Stage 2 amendment, which ensured that certain personal injury cases below £5,000 could still be raised in the Specialist Personal Injury Court, addresses concerns about cases which may be of no financial value, but of some complexity, complexity indeed of considerable interest to those taking the cases. His amendment on sanction for counsel, which put Chair of Taylor's proposed test on the equality of arms into the bill, was a considerable improvement on the bill as it stood previously. The amended bill now enables the Sheriff Court and Sheriff Appeal Court to sanction the employment of counsel where cases are difficult or complex and to prevent any party gaining an unfair advantage, for example, when a company defending a claim can afford to employ an advocate or QC and the plaintiff cannot. We would have liked to have gone further. Graham Pearson's Amendment 17 today would have introduced a presumption of sanction for counsel where somebody has died as a result of a personal injury in all work-related uh, personal injury cases and in personal cases, injury, uh, personal injury cases where the damages claimed exceeded £20,000. A sheriff could, however, have directed that this was inappropriate in certain cases, so there was a safeguard there. But even though this amendment, and indeed the amendments brought, proposed by Alison uh, McInnes, for which we had considerable sympathy, and it was only the fact that they would have uh, competed with our amendment that support, uh, prevented us from actually supporting them. Uh, but despite the fact that those amendments were not passed, the amendment to the bill at stage two has addressed significant concerns expressed initially by a range of stakeholders, including the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers and the Scottish Trade Union Council. The exclusive competence limit was reduced at stage two from 150,000 to 100,000 on an amendment for Sandra White. Uh, and that was a considerable reduction uh, and, and was welcome. The revised financial memorandum suggests that this would apply to 70% apply to of personal injury cases, which would now transfer, transfer from the Court of Session to the Sheriff Court instead of the 80% originally uh, envisaged. Uh, however, the figure of 80% was hotly disputed by APIL, the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers, and by the Faculty of Advocates at Stage 1. And APIL, in fact, envisaged that 96% of cases would have transferred at the original level. And I think it's still to be seen whether that estimate of 70% is actually uh, correct and is borne out in practice. Some committee members, myself included, argued for limits of 30,000 and 50,000, which have had uh, limits similar to the uh, other parts of the United Kingdom, although I understand in England and Wales recently increased its levels to 100,000 for non-personal injury cases. I did give consideration to re resubmitting an amendment on a lower privative level. However, apart from the fact it would be unlikely to succeed, I think the amendment on sanction of counsel does help address some of those initial concerns, particularly in the right, uh, light of the amendments from uh, Graham Pearson and Alison McInnes, which, as I say, unfortunately were not successful. We also welcome the clarification by amendment that the exclusive competence limit applies to the aggregate value of the claim where more than one order is sought. The committee supported ministerial amendments to sections 18, 88 and 89 on the remit of cases between courts. These two are an improvement. A sheriff may request that a case below the limit of exclusive competence be remitted to the court of session if that sheriff uh, feels that the importance or the difficulty of the case makes that appropriate. The test of exceptional circumstances, which Lord Gill himself thought, uh, felt was too high in the original form of the bill, uh, was also removed. Uh, and an additional amendment enabled a decision by a sheriff not to remit a court of the session to be appealed to the sheriff uh, appeal court. And these were all welcomed. However, as I stated during the discussion of my amendments on behalf of Clydeside Action and Asbestos, uh, that organisation was not reassured by Sheriff Taylor's statements that cases of sufficient complexity would be remitted to the Court of Session. I am not sure, of course, what was discussed in the regular meetings which the Cabinet Secretary promised he was having with the Clydeside Action and Asbestos, but it was clearly insufficient to meet their requests. And therefore, it was disappointing today that Parliament was not willing to give sufferers from asbestos-related diseases and their families the reassurances they sought and how they will be supported through the Court system. And I think we witnessed that disappointment when uh, the members of CAA left the, the gallery today, that they had hoped that Parliament would continue to support them in the way in which I think Parliament has supported them in the past. Uh, and I know that they were extremely disappointed. During the stage one debate, I stated that Labour would support the bill at stage one, but wished to see it amended. It has been amended, not to the extent which we, we might have wished. Uh, and in summing up, I'm sure I will return to some of our remaining concerns. However, as most of the major concerns raised with us when the bill was introduced have been addressed to a significant extent, we will therefore also be supporting the passage of this bill tonight in recognition that reform and modernisation of the court system is necessary. But can I repeat in saying so that it is also very important that the, the resourcing of these, refor uh, these reforms is scrutinised 
And as we are not able to do that through the, the amendments I propose, I hope that we will find other ways of scrutinising uh, the way in which the, these reforms are resourced as those take effect in future years. Many thanks. I will now call on Margaret Mitchell. Five minutes or thereby, please, Mrs Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the Stage 3 debate of the Courts Reform Scotland Bill and take this opportunity to thank the Justice Committee clerks for their hard work and the convener and fellow committee members and respondents for their contributions. It is imperative that the Scottish Parliament seeks to improve not just the quality of justice, but crucially, access to justice. This view formed the foundations of the comprehensive Scottish Civil Courts Review. And as the Cabinet Secretary has already stated alarmingly, the same review concluded that Scottish Civil Courts are failing to deliver justice because of a system that is slow, inefficient and expensive. This is clearly an entirely unacceptable situation for the people of Scotland, not least because justice delayed is justice denied. So the Scottish Conservatives have supported this bill in principle as it puts in place long overdue reforms to Scotland's courts. However, there are without doubt areas of concern within the bill and provisions which I could and would argue should have been implemented in order to strengthen and improve this legislation. For example, as already stated, increasing the public's access to justice is of paramount importance. Yet in terms of judicial review, it remains unclear whether this particular criterion has in fact been fulfilled. For it is far from evident that a three month time limit and the real prospect of success test will increase access to justice for the public. Amendments in my name sought to clarify the test, which not unreasonably could be perceived as subjective and amendments tabled by Alison McInnes suitably extended the time limits to ensure that community groups in particular could have sufficient time to organise themselves, marshal their arguments and secure the necessary funding. It's a matter of great regret that these amendments, together with the ones tabled by Elaine Murray on this issue, were voted down. Furthermore, Ensuring sufficient summary sheriffs are in place is key to the success of this legislation. Any piecemeal introduction of summary sheriffs by the government would put this success in jeopardy. This is especially the case given the detrimental impact of court closures on the efficient delivery of justice. For, as recent figures confirm, these court closures are already adversely affecting the time it is taking to resolve cases. In June this year, only 63% of sheriff and JP cases were resolved from caution to verdict within the target 26 weeks. That compares to 74% in September 2003. And between 2009 and 14, the number of share of court cases seen within the target of 26 weeks fell from 75.7% to 70.9%, a five-year low. This despite a 14% fall in the number of cases heard over the same period. It remains to be seen what the full impact of the court closures will be, but at time of declining court capacity, what isn't in doubt is that this bill's provisions will further stretch share of courts, which are already facing the prospect of losing nearly 2,000 sitting days. Worse still is that the Crown and Procurator fiscal staff, victims and witnesses, and those innocent people who have a case hanging over them will suffer further. Finally, the creation of a Sheriff Appeal Court is a sensible provision which, because it differs consider considerably from the Guild Review's original proposals, was rightly the subject of much debate at Stage 2. The Sheriff Appeal Court is central to many of the reforms contained within this Bill and its successful implementation is vital to the, su to the success of Court's reform more generally. But Lord Gill's concern that it is inappropriate for an appellate court to consist of members of the same level of the judiciary hierarchy 
is uh, as those from an appeal, uh, for, uh, as those from whom an appeal is marked, remains given the amendment to address this was unsuccessful. In conclusion, presiding officer, court reform is both needed and welcome, but the Scottish Government must not conflate the opportunity for change with an opportunity to cut costs. So it's entirely right that a watching brief is kept on the provisions in the Court Reform Scotland Bill to ensure, ensure that they increase the efficiency of our courts and genuinely increase access to justice for the public. Many thanks. And we now move to open debate. Uh, four minutes. Uh, speeches, please, and I call on Christine Graham to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Oh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I thank Margaret Mitchell for thanking committee members and thanking me, and I also thank, and I'm not being frivolous, all the witnesses who give up their time so often to give evidence to committees. Um, my goodness, it seems a long time ago since we started on this particular piece of legislation. I say to Lane Murray that, of course, we don't need reports to Parliament to tell us our legislation is working. We can have post-legislative scrutiny. We did it today with the 2005 Act on grooming. And, of course, it's always open to opposition parties to bring motions to the Scottish Parliament to hold the government to account. But I, too, join others in welcoming the bill modernising the civil court system, which I used to practice many moons ago, following in the main Lord Gill's review, although excluding the review of children's hearings, which is dealt with elsewhere. But I think what we must remember about the civil courts in Scotland is the flexibility of the civil court process. If I take, for example, raising the privative limit from 5,000 to 100,000 in the sheriff court, bearing in mind... That's the claim. It's not necessarily where we end up at the end of the day, either at the end of a proof or in settlement. It is always open to seek a remit to a higher court. The court of session, for example, it's open to the sheriff to decide whether or not he feels his case is of such complexity in law or in fact to remit it, or one of the parties to an action can remit. So where we have these limits, they're not set in stone. A uh, specialist personal injury court, the sheriff, is to be welcomed, but again, litigants have the option of having the case dealt with in their local sheriff court or a specialist sheriff court, presumably on legal advice. I very much welcome the introduction of summary sheriffs. I've often been involved in cases way back where really the sheriff's time was pretty well wasted with the level of case with which he or she was dealing and could be dealt with in a different manner and in a different way. Uh, so I, I really think, without saying there's a, a top-level sheriff and a lower-level sheriff, we certainly could use shrivel time to better effect, particularly if we're going to pair off some of those sheriffs to become specialists in areas of law, which again is to be welcomed. As for the allocation of cases, I would say to Margaret Mitchell and others, it's for the sheriff principal to look at a case in the early stages and decide whether or not given that it should go to a certain court on paper, it may actually have to go elsewhere or, in fact, to a sheriff rather than a summary sheriff. So we have that. I certainly welcome equality of arms in the sanction of counsel. Again, in my days, uh, in my early youthful days uh, as a mature student graduating to be a practitioner, I was horrified to find an advocate on the other side complete with wig and a whole lot of books in front of them. Usually it was just um, props. They didn't even look at them, but they looked as if they were going to use them all and terrified me in those early days. And you did feel then that the client would be looking at you saying, why have I got you and not somebody else wearing a wig? So I think equality of arms is terribly important, but it can't be based on the importance of the case uh, to the client. Every client's case is important to them. That's why they're standing in court. That's why they've pushed it that far. I welcome simple procedure, the £5,000 limit. I welcome the fact that there would be intervention of the sheriff's bench in these particular cases to move along where necessary. And again, if that case proves to be complex, it can be remitted to a higher court. Now, I want to say very quickly about the asbestosis cases. I don't think you should misunderstand the fact that I, amongst others, was not prepared to make that a special case to be in a special court, extremely sympathetic. But when you're making the law, you have to look at the principle being applied. And that principle must be applied across as far as we can see. So worthy, worthy though those cases were, if you made a special case for those, I, I was concerned that if, some, if something else came along, there also ought to be special category 
You've got to create that. And then where do you end? And you get do into you all kinds close, of difficulties please? of judgment. So working on principle, I regret, but I think it's important that we put them all on the same basis. And indeed, many will indeed be remitted uh, to the uh, Court of Session if complexity uh, provides you. for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Colin Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Alison McInnes. Presiding officer, I'm obviously not so well informed as other speakers who all seem to be either ministers or members of the Justice Committee, but I first became interested in this bill uh, as a member of the Finance Committee when we studied the financial memorandum, and subsequently uh, I listened to the concern of those affected by workplace accidents and diseases. Uh, like Elaine Murray, therefore, I certainly uh, support uh, the need for reform to uh, the civil courts, and I'm grateful that uh, my former colleague Cathy Jamieson commissioned the review uh, some seven years ago. Uh, my conclusion, however, there's, is that in some respects it has gone too far uh, and in other respects is uh, financially problematic. Access to justice has been a theme of uh, two or three previous debates uh, uh, in, uh, this afternoon, and, and I think I've spoken a couple of them myself, so I don't want to repeat in detail what I said then, but I, I still am concerned in particular for those who are affected by workplace uh, accidents and diseases. I think it's unfortunate that they uh, were not, have not been granted uh, automatic right to counsel, and I think it's also uh, particularly regrettable that those uh, affected by asbestos uh, have not ha had the right to hear their cases heard in the court of session. Uh, the, the, those cases usually are very complex, and it may well be that they usually uh, end up there. But I think it would have been better to uh, accept that uh, this Parliament has regarded those affected by asbestos as a special case, and it's regrettable that we didn't do so today. In general, as the Cabinet Secretary said in his contribution, uh, the skills of justice have been tipped against those affected by workplace accidents and diseases because of Section uh, 69 of the UK Parliament Enterprise Act. But, Act. but I think the least we could have done would have been to take every action possible to uh, redress the balance in favour uh, of those victims. Having said that, there were some uh, uh, very welcome changes made at, uh, at uh, stage two of the bill, and clearly that makes the bill better than it was uh, as introduced. In terms of the financial memorandum, again, I spoke in the debate uh, uh, in favour of uh, Elaine Murray's sunrise clause, which I think would have been the best way to deal with the financial problems. I still think that no satisfactory answer has been given to the, the loss of fee income issue. We can debate whether it's 70% or 80% of cases that are being transferred, but the figure of £1 million lost in fee income is generally uh, accepted. The legal aid savings, as I said earlier, uh, are doubtful, and uh, there is the increased workload issue. We're already hearing uh, that it's taking longer to process cases in the Sheriff Court, partly because of uh, Sheriff Court uh, closures, uh, and clearly there is uh, going to be an increased workload there, and, and again, it's not uh, obvious how that is to be managed. Yes, of course, there will be the specialist court, but will two sheriffs be able to cope with all the work of that court or will other sheriffs have to be deployed as well? The final point, and I would like an answer in the summing up on this, is to do with the IT uh, systems. There was an issue uh, earlier on about the fact that only £10,000 had been set aside for it. We were told that other money would um, uh, be used for that, but uh, uh, I would like to know when these systems are to be in place. I've been told autumn 2016. Perhaps the Minister could confirm that or otherwise. One final point in the last half minute about access to justice in environmental matters. The Justice Committee recognised the differences between the Aris Convention and the scope of judicial review in Scots law. One way of alleviating the situation would have been to extend the time for appeal. That was rejected by the government. I think the best um, solution is the in introduction of an environmental tribunal. I'm told that was in the SNP's election manifesto for the 2011 election, so it would be interested to know uh, when that tribunal will be set up. Many thanks. And I now call on Alison McInnes to be followed by Sandra White. Four minutes, please. Thank you. I'd like to thank the legislation team for their support in helping me draft amendments and the Justice Committee clerks as ever and those who took time to give evidence for their contributions as the uh, convener of the committee has already done so. Um, working in conjunction with the Scottish Civil Justice Council's modernisation programme, this bill will enable our court structures to undergo significant reform. Noteworthy innovations include the creation of the Sheriff Appeal Court, 
summary sheriffs and specialist sheriff courts with Scotland-wide jurisdiction. It was welcome that we were able to make progress on issues including revising the tests on remitting cases to the Court of Session and including the Taylor test for granting counsel. However, I remain concerned, as I said earlier this afternoon, that the Taylor test, while a step forward, will still unreasonably restrict the ability of parties to be represented by skilled counsel, and I am therefore disappointed that my Amendment 66 to 72 were not adopted today. Can I take the opportunity to thank the Minister um, and give the, her the thanks of my colleagues Liam MacArthur and Tavish Scott, who are away on parliamentary business. They welcome her assurances that the gradual abolition of honorary sheriffs will only take place in rural island communities if the alternatives have been shown to meet their needs. And we're grateful for that reassurance, Minister. In the short time I have remaining, I would, however, like to remind members of some of the problems we encountered during the passage of the bill of unsubstantiated and inconsistent proposals. The Bill provided an opportunity to ensure that disputes are heard at the most appropriate level. The increase in the privative jurisdiction of the Sheriff Court was the most significant change in this respect. However, there was a dearth of evidence to inform our consideration of the correct limit. With the little information we were given, it was, and I quote, unclear how robust the data in question is and the degree to which it can be considered as a representative or reliable sample of cases, end quote. Not my words, but those of the Scottish Parliament's independent information centre. So we considered alternative privative jurisdictions, 30,000, 50,000, but without more information, the committee was forced to take a stab in the dark in setting it at 100,000. And I don't think that's good enough, and it remains to be seen whether a 1,900% increase will erode access to justice. On judicial review, I'm disappointed that the time period allowed for applications has remained at three months. That will increase the probability of it being needlessly restrictive and unduly erode access to justice, particularly, I think, for community groups. Presiding officer, under this SNP government, sheriff courts in 13 towns across Scotland have closed within the last year, including those in Stonehaven and Arbroath in my northeast region. Four more will follow in January 2015. These closures appear incompatible with the transfer of business that this bill will generate. Aberdeen has already received an influx of business from Stonehaven and is already running close to capacity. Can it cope with more? We have been given scant assurances. And I worry because the Cabinet Secretary has already confirmed to this Parliament that the average time taken for the conclusion of summary criminal cases in the Sheriff Court increased from 139 days in September 2013 to 157 days in June 2014. The Parliament was given the opportunity today by Elaine Murray to receive regular feedback and be assured that the system could manage before key sections of the Bill are implemented. And I'm really disappointed that they were rejected. Finally, it's worth recalling that at the conclusion of Stage 1, members unanimously agreed to the general principles of the Bill. However, the main opposition parties took the rare step of rejecting the financial memorandum amid concerns about its accuracy. And I would urge ministers to ensure in the future that they develop more coherent and properly evidenced and costed legislation before presenting it to this Parliament. Nonetheless, Scottish Liberal Democrats close, broadly please. believe this package of reforms will better equip our courts to deal with the demands placed upon them and improve the experience of service users. And we will support the bill today on that basis. Many thanks. And I now call on Sandra White to be followed by John Finney. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Can I also join in and thank my fellow committee members and the clerks and the many organisations and individuals who gave evidence. I also want to thank the CABSEC, the Minister and the Scottish Government uh, for listening, I believe, and in accepting a number of concerns raised, including my own, which was put into an amendment and uh, has already been mentioned and was accepted by the committee. So I think thanks is due in that particular aspect also. Uh, presiding officer, there's no doubt that reform of Scottish uh, court service has been long overdue, and as Elaine Murray had said previously, it was first looked at by the Labour Justice Minister, Cathy Jimison, in 2007. 
and to declare that actually at the time, and if I can read that out, that the review will have a clear remit to produce recommendations for change to ensure that the civil justice system deals with cases justly, within a reasonable time, and most importantly, at a reasonable cost. And I raise that issue because obviously Elaine Murray and others had raised the fact about uh, the cause. And if I can just go on to that forward uh, to Lord Gill, uh, when he mentioned at the committee at the stage one session in April, uh, from the work that has been done by the Scottish Court Service and the Scottish Civil Justice Council, I'm absolutely satisfied that the reforms can be adequately funded. So I would hope that would delay some of the fears that perhaps uh, Elaine Murray and others uh, have been uh, raising uh, throughout the debate. I want to turn now, President Officer, I made to uh, the fact about uh, the Clydesdale action on asbestos and some of the issues that have been raised there. Now, having worked alongside Clydesdale action of asbestos for, for many years, along with some of my colleagues, Gil Patterson, Bill Kidd, MSP, Stuart Millen, uh, MSP, and, and there is many others as well, and I'm sorry that they're not here in the, uh, the gallery to, to listen to, to the, the, the actual debate as well. Uh, I do want to thank them very, very much for the work that they have uh, carried out in this year tenacity. If it wasn't for, for that group, I doubt very much it would even be where we are just now. But I do want to pick up on some of the issues and perhaps I highlight some of the issues uh, basically, and I also must say that uh, the committee uh, itself, the committee, not just individual MSPs, was not persuaded uh, to take this on as a particular a criteria or a special case. Now, I mean, it's been said time and time again, I think we have to, to mention this as well, that all cases all cases that merit counsel will continue to benefit from the expertise of counsel. Now, they're not just my words, they're others' words uh, as well. And if you listen to Sheriff Principal Taylor, a complex asbestosis case will probably be remitted to the court of session. However, even if it were to remain in the Sheriff Court, it would almost certainly merit sanction for counsel. Now, that was said over and again with evidence, and certainly when we had people from Clydeside action for asbestos, uh, you know, I, I certainly thought that uh, they had accepted that fact, uh, that Sheriff Principal Taylor and the Cabinet Secretary and other uh, learned uh, friends from the judiciary had basically said they would get counsel they wouldn't think at all that they wouldn't get counsel. So, you know, I was quite surprised, you know, that uh, that was taken on board. Um, my memory of it is it was certainly taken on board by the people who came along to the committee in, in that respect. And all of a sudden it seems to have changed now. But uh, I would like to, obviously, and I will uh, go back and speak to Clydeside Actions for Asbestos, because it's been said, as I said, over and over again, that basically the number of issues that's been raised by them and actually looked at by the Scottish Government in legislation. I don't need to get into it. Cabinet Secretary said that in his opening remarks, and I'm sure it will be there uh, you know, for people, people to read. We have done as much as possible. And as I said before, I think, I thank the Clydeside Action for his bestest who have worked so diligently alongside MSPs from all political parties and alongside the government also. And uh, I see that the changes that's coming forward uh, in this uh, you know, bill, and I think they should be you know, looked at, and I think we should accept them, because I think they're very, very good. We will look at the principal sheriffs as well. I think it's a very much vast improvement from what previously we had. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. And I now call on John Finney, after which we'll move to closing speeches. Thank you, President Officer. Um, civil law is very important in the lives of our citizens uh, because it deals with their rights and their obligations. And uh, echoing the words of the Cabinet Secretary when he quoted Lord Gill talking about the present system being slow and efficient and expensive. And it was for that reason he looked at the structure and the functions. Uh, I was concerned on a very uh, local level on the issue picked up by my colleague Alison McInnes about temporary sheriffs and the, the wording that was used in respect of that. They wouldn't expect, not expect that there will be many changes, but also in the policy memorandum about remote and rural areas talked about things being envisaged and seems doubtful. So I think it's important that we do keep a watching brief on uh, how they, if that's affected in, in some of our remoter areas. Um, the, also, the intention to have maximum flexibility in deployment, I think, is terribly important and picks up the point that the convener mentioned about directing cases to the most appropriate person to deliberate over them. Similarly, there's issues around part-time sheriffs and uh, I, I know that they are going to decrease over time, but I recently met a part-time sheriff who had, was very casually dressed but had robed up for an emergency uh, sitting, so there, there clearly is a need for them. 
Um, throughout the, the evidence we heard, we heard about um, competing views about what's uh, important and special. Well, I have to tell you, I think every case is important. And uh, um, some of the terminology inadvertently offended people. So when we talked about summary and simple procedures, particularly in relation to um, supporters of domestic violence, they saw this quite wrongly as a downgrading. Um, uh, I'm a keen supporter of domestic violence courts and I'd like to, to see them um, extended. Likewise, a strong supporter of alternative uh, dispute resolution, and again, uh, we heard from the domestic violence people that was inappropriate in, in their uh, caseload. There's much discussion about the exclusive competence, and we did move from the current situation of 5,000 to um, an agreement on a, a, an amendment from my colleague Sandra White to 100,000. And I, I think, while some have been critical of that, I think that shows the worth of the scrutiny that's gone into this legislation. Likewise, um, the proposal about um, the personal injury courts, I know that there's um, been widespread support for that um, and the change that took place uh, um, and picking up on the issues that Cabinet Secretary alluded to about the attack on health and safety of workers and workplace that's been put in place by the UK Government and the steps that have been put in there to ameliorate that. And I certainly would support uh, um, the removal of that piece of legislation if we get the opportunity. Um, the role of trade unions is vital in that, and I know that they've watched very closely how the committee responded to that, and I hope they uh, appreciate that we, we take their role very importantly and have responded positively to that with the amendments proposed. That's because workplace incidents are inherently complex, not just because of the nature of the case, but the nature of the relationship that exists there. So uh, I, I think um, we need to uh, consider also uh, that uh, these changes are going to create a vibrancy throughout our, our system, um, as all changes do. And with these new systems will come new challenges. Uh, and the real test, I think, will be whether the citizen is properly served by the civil justice system. And only time will tell that. And I'm sure that we will maintain a watching brief on that particular issue. Just picking up, seeing Malcolm, um, Malcolm Chisholm back in the chamber there, picking up on a point he made, I could refer him to paragraph 322 of our stage one report, where we said, the committee is sympathetic to calls for the introduction of an environmental tribunal in Scotland. And like you, I certainly hope that's something that the Scottish Government will pick up on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Finney. We now move to the wind-up speeches. I call on Margaret Mitchell. Ms Mitchell, four minutes. Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. This has been a good debate. The Court Reform Scotland Bill provisions do represent a radical departure from the status quo and many members have voiced concerns about some aspects of the legislation. In particular, the absence of empirical evidence to inform certain basic provisions, such as the, the threshold for cases to be transferred from the court of session to the sheriff court, has been less than satisfactory. But there is no doubt that the threshold at which these transfers should be pitched has been keenly debated, and that the threshold level does potentially have far-reaching consequences for ensuring equality of representation for court users involved in the litigation. At present, counsel can be instructed and automatically granted in the court of session. This is not the case in the sheriff court. Whilst the ability to refer complex case cases which are below the £100,000 threshold to the court of session is provided for in the bill, it is nonetheless important that we keep a watchful eye on the important issue of equality of arms and the associated costs of litigation. The Taylor Reviews provision on expenses goes some way towards tackling this. And it's true to say that the bill lays the foundation for Sheriff Principal Taylor's recommendations, which in large part address the impact of litigation expenses on access to justice. But it's the recommendation on damages-based uh, agreements which could encourage solicitors and solicitor advocates in the Sheriff Court to take on financial, financially riskier cases um, of those people who do not qualify for legal aid but who equally cannot privately fund litigation. 
In so doing, this recommendation seeks to ensure that access to legal represent representation is more widely available. In addition to this, the qualified one-way costs shifting recommendation seeks to ensure that no one should be deterred from litigation through fear of bankruptcy, which arguably um, is an in injustice in itself. In short, the Taylor Review serves as a reminder that the deliver of, de delivery of justice is predicated on a number of interrelated elements, not just courts reform. These two measures provide an important remedy for litigants who do not pursue gen genuine cases because of the fear of and uncertainties surrounding costs. It's understood that the government intends to um, implement these recommendations incrementally, but some of these recommend recommendations go some way to creating a fairer and more accessible justice system. And as such, I urge the Cabinet Secretary to implement these recommendations as expediently as possible. I end on a, a cautionary note, presiding officer. With court closures still underway and with so many unknowns, proactive and diligent scrutiny must be maintained on how the bill's provisions are working in practice. Court closures were decided without consulting Parliament, and although there is now a commitment to involve members in these decision, decisions going forward, this lack of consultation is an unhappy precedent which should not be repeated in the future. However, in the meantime, perhaps in his closing remarks, the Cabinet Secretary could further clarify how the government intends to increase the burden of cases being heard in the share of courts while simultaneously advocating a policy of court closures. Thank you. I now call Elaine Murray. Ms Murray, six minutes. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And can I also start by thanking the clerks uh, and the witnesses, in particular those witnesses who took the trouble with people like myself who didn't have a background in the justice system to, make, to illustrate to us and to take us to the courts to make sure that we uh, actually understood some of the issues we were discussing. Uh, in the opening of the debate, I rehearsed some of the changes to the bill uh, at which had been made at stage two, uh, which have addressed the concerns of stakeholders. But I have to repeat, like others, that we still do have concerns, not just not so much just about the wording of the bill or the principles behind it, but particularly whether there's sufficient capacity to, to adequately resource the changes that it will bring uh, into effect. There was, as I said, significant disagreement about the numbers of cases which will be transferred from the Court of Session to the, the Sheriff Court, and I made reference to the differences between the, what the government had estimated uh, and the estimates for uh, organisations such as the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers. Um, it, we will see wh who is right. We don't know who is right at the moment. We will see. Uh, and uh, uh, if the uh, Association of Personal Injury Lawyers turn, to turn out to be right, we'll have to ask what will be done to, to address some of that. And we'll also have to ask, I think uh, Malcolm Chisholm made reference to the uh, potential loss of a, of a million pounds in fee income to the court service. If that uh, comes to pass, there will be issues which have to be addressed there. I think Alison McInnes made points about the transfer of cases between uh, the courts, and we know that there is to be one specialist personal injury court sitting in Edinburgh, although indeed there may well be specialist injury sheriffs available at other courts. The government's own figures state that the average uh, a number of personal injury cases initiated in the court, session, a court of session over the last three years was 1,855. So if 70% of those are going to change, they anticipate when this is fully implemented that 1,300 personal injury cases are expected to transfer annually uh, to the Sheriff Court. I don't think that this includes the cases which are below the exclusive competence but are remitted to the course of session because of complexity or the need for a quality of arms. So the figure might indeed be smaller than that. And admittedly, many will set, uh, settle uh, uh, before coming to court, as, as indeed they do in the court of session. But potentially, there could be 25 personal injury court cases com coming into the new specialist personal uh, injury court each week. Uh, and that's a court which at first is only going to have two specialist sheriffs. Um, that, that does raise concerns as to how it is to be handled. And the government's figures also suggest that at least 227 other cases, commercial, family and ordinary cases, could be transferred to the uh, Sheriff Court. Mr McCaskill's letter describing amendments to the financial memorandum in light of the stage two changes suggests that this figure is, is actually an underestimate. 27% of commercial cases and 25% of ordinary cases, we were told, had been recorded as having no value but actually have, quote, a sum in the alternative, quote. I have absolutely no idea whatever that might, might be, uh, but it suggests also that a portion of those cases is also going to transfer. So, you know, the, the, people say there's not going to be a tsunami of, of cases, but there does look as if there's a potential for a fair number of cases to come through. 
Moreover, the other side of that is that the Court of Session therefore stands to lose 42% of its current business, which suggests it could actually be rather un underemployed. Uh, I don't know a lot about judges, but I imagine that they have contracts and are still entitled to be paid. Uh, so I do rather question in that case what, what the efficiency savings might be. Now, I know that the government believe that 85% of commercial cases currently in the Scottish court system would remain with the Court of Session. And I also know that they hope that, that additional commercial cases will be attracted to the Scottish system. But I haven't actually seen any particular evidence uh, for their optimism on this issue. I think Malcolm Chisholm made another important uh, point about the Aris Convention, Convention and the need for the introduction of environmental tribunals. Now, this was mentioned when we were discussing the tribunals bill when it was going through. And, and at that point, um, we were informed that the environment minister had made, uh, had advised that the Rural uh, Affairs and Climate Change and Environment Committee, uh, that he intended to bring in uh, a legislation uh, for an environmental tribunal. Uh, that's gone very quiet since then, and I would repeat, actually, the, the, the question which Malcolm posed during his contribution is, when is that going to happen? It appeared to be a, you know, a, a manifesto commitment of, of the government. We've also had a minister saying that he intends to do it, uh, and yet we have less than two years of this um, uh, parliament uh, uh, in this session of Parliament remaining. And I wonder, perhaps when we eventually we are told about the legislative programme for this, this year, we will find that an environmental tribunal is to be there. One could maybe hope so. As far as the burdens on sheriff courts are concerned, we have heard, heard many reassurances from the Lord President, the Scottish Court Service, the sheriff's principals and the Scottish Government that everything is going to be fine on the night. The resources will be in pla place, the volume of build-up will be gradual. We all hope, uh, hope that is true. I'm sure that they hope it's true. I'm sure they intend it is true. But we also hear from our own constituents uh, about the congestion in the courts. We hear about people turning up at court to be turned away because there is no sheriff available to hear the case. We hear, hear of family law cases involving the care of children being dragged out through lack of capacity in the courts. And we know that the, also that the process of closure of the sheriff courts has not yet, yet been completed. Uh, and we've been told of delays. I've already said what was said. As I have recently heard reported about the Dumfries Sheriff Court. We know about problems at Hamilton. And phase three of the programme, which includes Dingwall, Duns, Peebles and Haddington, a busy Sheriff Court, those are scheduled for January next year. They haven't even happened yet. So what pressures will those closures bring to bear in the courts in Edinburgh, which we know are already very busy? Now, the Gov Justice Committee has agreed to look at the court surface as part of its scrutiny of the, of the budget this year. And that may illuminate some of the problems, but it will be too late too late to influence this bill if it does reveal serious uh, resourcing issues. Finally, can I say on the issues in terms of uh, the, my amendments, my unsuccessful amendments on the reporting uh, and the commencement of sections 39 and 37, policy is the responsibility of government. Ensuring that the resources are, are available to implement policy decisions are the responsibility of government. I'm disappointed that, that Parliament is not taking forward these responsibilities. We will support the bill tonight, but we do expect the government to ensure that its provisions do not cause detriment to core users. Thank you. I now call on Rosanna Cunningham to wind up the debate for the government. Uh, Ms Cunningham, till six o'clock. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, and could I also thank members for their uh, various comments uh, um, due, during the debate, most of which were in fact constructive. Uh, I also acknowledge the concerns that have been uh, expressed and, and we do take due note of them. Uh, central to the bill are two very important objectives, uh, to make justice more accessible to more people and indeed to lower the cost of getting justice. The proposals contained in the bill will make a tangible and positive difference in both respects. We received broad support from advocacy and consumer groups, solicitors firms and the judiciary for the concepts and proposals detailed in the consultation on the bill. And even those who've raised concerns with certain aspects, such as the Faculty of Advocates and the STUC, have all expressed general support for the overall aims of the bill. And I think that's reflected in the comments uh, from opposition spokespeople today, that in general terms, they do support uh, the overall aims of this bill. If I could expand for a moment on what the Cabinet Secretary has already said about complex cases. The committee heard evidence from a number of stakeholders on this. It was really important that we did get this right in the bill, and I believe that we now have. We've made improvements to the bill as a result of debate, and discussion that will ensure that where cases are complex, 
they will be able to access appropriate legal representation. However, yes, of course. Gil Patterson. Um, we know that asbestos sufferers have had to fight all the way, particularly against insurance companies, uh, to be properly compensated, and that the Cabinet Secretary has been to the forefront in that battle in, uh, in this Parliament, indeed. Therefore, since the Sheriff Principal Taylor indita indicated that counsel will be available to asbestos cases, no matter the court that the case is heard in, can you say, is the right to counsel implicit for asbestos cases? Minister. Uh, well, we've made a, a number of repeated reassurances in respect of asbestos cases, uh, and it is our expectation that the overwhelming majority of asbestos cases would continue uh, uh, to have counsel uh, arguing. It's difficult to see an asbestos case that wouldn't. And I will come back to the, the issue of asbestos cases because I think it's quite important in the context of this uh, debate. Uh, because we do want to ensure that where cases are complex, it will be able to access appropriate legal representation. However, these changes acknowledge that it is not up to us as the government or even as parliamentarians to decide what is and what is not a complex case, but quite rightly provide the necessary flexibility for the courts to decide this in individual cases. We have enshrined the principle that sheriffs need to have regard when granting sanction for counsel to the resources of each of the parties, which I think we can safely say enshrines the principle of fairness and equality espoused by Sheriff Principal Taylor when he made his various recommendations. And we've acknowledged that we needed to provide more flexibility in relation to cases being able to be brought in the personal injury court, as well as responding to concerns regarding the tests on remit to permit genuinely complex cases to be able to be remitted to the higher courts. I would like to take a, a few moments to look forward, if I may, to what we envisage if this bill is successfully passed, as I hope it will be. As members will be aware, this bill is one of the key planks in the Making Justice Work programme. We will be working together with the Scottish Court Service, Judicial Office, the Scottish Legal Aid Board and other justice partners to ensure that the measures in the Bill are implemented in a timely and appropriate fashion. I know that the Lord President is keen to see uh, the reforms that he recommends take shape swiftly, and we will work with our partners in monitoring the progress to ensure that sufficient resources are in place to deliver the key measures in the Bill. Now, um, my colleague Gil Patterson uh, raised the issue of asbestos cases, and uh, that was understandably an issue raised by a number of members uh, throughout the afternoon. Uh, and it is, of course, the case that asbestos cases can be complex. We do expect that these cases will continue to be heard in the court of session, or if not, they would almost certainly merit sanction for counsel. It would be a very unusual asbestos case uh, that would not. Those cases in the court of session before the exclusive competence is raised will see out their natural life there. Complex cases will also be able to be remitted to the higher courts under the bill. And the changes we've made mean that the equality of legal representation of both sides in a dispute will be taken into account by the sheriff. And the circumstances that were described by my colleague Christine Graham when she began as a very new lawyer confronting an advocate on the other side would be an issue for the sheriff to consider when he was looking at a request for sanction. And that will enshrine in law the principles of fairness and equality from Sheriff Principal Taylor's recommendations. Uh, people, uh, a number of members have raised issues that, uh, that come under the category of cost, savings and budget. Uh, um, the committee noted that a substantial budget has not been set aside for courts reform. But these reforms are about a reorganisation of the existing resources of the courts, as well as doing things in the most efficient way possible. If I could refer to the very specific point raised by Malcolm Chisholm, the £10,000 figure in the financial memorandum is to cover updates to existing systems for implementation. However, the member is correct in that there is a larger IT project uh, that is being undertaken uh, irrespective of the specific reforms in this bill. Uh, and that larger project is rightly the responsibility of the Scottish Court Service. Um, 
Uh, a number of other members have talked about the impact of court closures on uh, various business volumes, but the current programme of court closures was approved by Parliament and does result in the redistribution of 5% of share of court business to other courts. And as I stated earlier, there will not be a sudden transfer of the existing cases from the Court of Session into the Personal Injury Court, but rather a gradual building of workload. And uh, Eric McQueen from the Scottish Court Service also told the committee that the exclusive competence will not be raised until the Personal Injury Court is ready to receive cases. Remember, the civil caseload in Scotland continues to fall overall. The latest statistics from our civil law statistics in Scotland 2012-13 uh, show a 41% decline in civil actions from 2008-09 to 2012-13. Uh, uh, the specific point raised by both Malcolm Chisholm and John Finney in respect of uh, the setting up of an environmental tribunal or court, also raised by Elaine Murray, uh, we have not yet consulted on this because we think it appropriate that the significant programme of reforms to the civil justice system come into effect before we consider with stakeholders the need for an environmental court tribunal. Uh, these reforms include protective expenses orders, the Regulatory Reform Scotland Act 2014 and indeed this bill. So we wanted to make sure that all of that was in place before we went back to stakeholders to talk about uh, what might be needed uh, extra. Presiding officer members, we have a role to play in ensuring that Scotland's court services are first class, are efficient and provide access to justice for the people of Scotland. And I believe that these reforms will significantly improve the administration of justice in our courts, improving the experience for users and delivering a civil court system fit for the 21st century, not only on paper, but also in reality. Uh, Lord Gill has stated uh, that our civil court system is slow, inefficient, uh, and expensive. He has recently reiterated, reiterated that these reforms are 50 years overdue. And by passing this bill today, we will be saying that we do not agree that people should be paying over the odds to litigate their cases, that they should not be experiencing unnecessary delays to their cases, and that they deserve a system that secures a just resolution to their issues in a reasonable time frame. And for all of these reasons, presiding officer, can I commend this bill to this parliament. Thank you, Ms Cunningham. That concludes the debate on the Courts Reform Scotland Bill. Just before we proceed to decision time, I wish to inform members that the subject of tonight's members' debate in the name of Marco Biaggi on Edinburgh's Housing Policy 10 is now the subject of active proceedings in the Court of Session. At the time that the business managers considered nominations for this week's business, there were no active court proceedings. This changed as of yesterday. I have consulted with the member in charge and all the business managers, and I am minded to accept a motion without notice from the Minister for Parliament to postpone tonight's member's business to a later date. Moved. Thank you. Um, I now put the question, are we all agreed? Thank you. We now move to decision time. There is one question to be put as a result of today's business. The question is that motion number 11101, in the name of Ken McCaskill, on the Courts Reform Scotland Bill, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to, and the Courts Reform Scotland Bill is passed. <laughs> That concludes decision time and I now close this meeting.